Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those <coughs> watching on the webcast, uh, welcome to today's public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission. Uh, for those watching on recording, it's about 1.30 on the 1st of February. Um, <coughs> I'm delighted to say that despite uh, rail strikes, uh, which unfortunately have hit us for the second consecutive board meeting, we do actually have 100% um, attendance today from our board colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> one of our executive directors is not in the room at the moment. Uh, Kate Taroni is currently uh, in central London a meeting with one of the ministers, but I hope we'll be uh, back to join us fairly shortly. Um, however, <clears throat> um, it's not just the rail strikes, but you're, many of you will be aware of the teacher strikes, which have caused major problems for some of our people who have child caring responsibilities. So we have agreed that the vast majority of presenters will actually join us virtually today, um, either because they can't get here or because they, they have home carrying arrangements. Uh, but we're grateful for the efforts everybody have made to, to either get here or make alternative arrangements. Uh, and a few other words in terms of uh, who is here. Uh, firstly, can I welcome Julia Corrigan Davis, who's our equality Network representative. Julia, you were there earlier. Um, <laughs> uh, but welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> to my right is uh, Namali De Silva. Uh, Namali is, is the head of governance, legal services, and deputising uh, following Rebecca Lloyd Jones, who left us towards the end of last year. Um, <clears throat> in fact, in due course, we're going to be joined by Kate Staples, who uh, hopefully the camera is working, is, is at the far left. Uh, Kate has actually joined us today as, as the new head of legal, um, <clears throat> but uh, she's really just observing today, so as, if, as now is necessary, we'll be supported by uh, Nimali. So just here today, but welcome, uh, Kate. We could have you on board. Um, I will mention it later on as well, uh, but uh, Mark Saxton, a uh, long-standing board member and our senior independent director, um, steps down at the end of, well, it's now nine months at the end of, uh, this month rather, that's the end of February. So, Mark, this will be your, your last board meeting. So, welcome. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think well, that's covered everything. I'll say just add to, to thanks for everyone making the uh, effort to come along today. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe I've been notified of any additional conflicts of interest, but I will just check. Don't see anyone putting their hand up. Um, and I don't believe there's any other urgent business to add to the agenda. Is, is that correct? Okay. Um, on that basis, let's move straight into uh, today's discussions. Um, the first item was actually down for me, which was just an oral update on board appointments uh, for the public, just for interested. Uh, in truth, there isn't much to say. Uh, it's reconfirming what you know is that... Uh, the uh, chair of HWE, who <coughs> um, Health Watch England, who is um, uh, also becomes a non-executive director of the board, left in, in November, um, and uh, we also have uh, Jora term ended, uh, and uh, I've already mentioned that Mark Saxon's term ends towards the end of this month. Um, <coughs> following recruitment exercise, uh, we completed interviews last November. Uh, so we are hoping for approval from ministers for new appointments to the board, uh, but, but that is still awaited. Uh, and on similar themes, since we last met, uh, but as flagged previously, uh, the chair of our Audit and Risk Assurance Committee, Sally Cheshire, has left us and is now chair of NHS Resolution. Uh, we do hope to be able to advertise the post to uh, replace her as chair of the ARAC shortly, uh, but again, we are waiting ministerial approval for that. Uh, just so people are aware, as an interim measure, uh, <coughs> Jeremy Boss, who's our independent member on the uh, uh, ARAC committee, uh, has agreed to step up um, and act as a joint chair, and he's been supported by uh, Mark Saxton uh, for the last few months to make sure we have links into this board. Obviously, since Mark goes at the end of this month, we are going to have to make uh, other arrangements since it's obvious now that we won't have uh, a new ARAC chair appointed by the end of this month. Probably the last thing I should, or two other things just mention, is that because we don't yet have a replacement HWE chair, uh, Belinda Black kindly agreed to act in an interim capacity, 
Uh, we've just renewed that. Uh, Belinda, th thank you very much indeed for taking that on. I know that the uh, HWE team who aren't here today are very grateful to have that uh, link. And Jorah, last but no means least, is still here because uh, although his full term as a non-executive ended uh, in uh, October, um, uh, agreed to accept appointment as an associate non-executive director, so uh, continues to be at this table. So I thank you, Jorah, for doing that. Um, so a bit of a long list. I hope we'll have an update uh, next time we meet at the end of March. Um, so let's move on to the other more formal business. The first thing is a market oversight, uh, market oversight update. My apologies. Um, this is to note what is going on. Ian, can I hand over to you to introduce Stuart and the topic? Thank you. Thanks, Ian, and, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. And uh, as Stuart Dean joins us, I'll, I'll just give you a, a couple of words by way of introduction. Um, so this is one of our regular updates to uh, the board on market oversight. Uh, the market oversight uh, team, as, as you know, is responsible for mo monitoring the large so-called hard-to-replace uh, providers in social care and then warning local authorities if there is likely to be service cessation as a result of business failure. That's two very distinct but, and joined things, service cessation as a result of business failure. What we don't do is we don't look at the health of the entire health and social care marketplace. Um, but what we can, we do what we do know is that where there are the, the, where with the themes that we see in these large providers often give us give us uh, some good pointers in terms of the overall financial health of the social care marketplace, particularly in areas like turnover, profitability cash flow and staffing challenges. So that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction before I hand over to, to Stuart to get into the, the detail. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, so just to emphasise uh, Ian's uh, point, first thing I sort of always uh, mention when talking about market oversight publicly is that the name is uh, misleading. We don't have a market oversight uh, role. Um, equally, we have no powers to prevent failure. Um, the scheme design has no protections to ensure a minimum notification window uh, to the impacted local authorities. And further to a judicial review last year, the legal threshold that uh, and criteria that Ian has talked to uh, has actually increased. There's currently 62 providers in the scheme that equates to broadly 30% of the market. The unseen influence of market oversight should not be underestimated. Indeed, our best work will frequently be invisible to the general public. In that regard, I would like to place on record my thanks to colleagues for their continued hard work and dedication. Turning to the financial insights, I should stress at the outset that this trending only relates to market oversight names, so typically the larger providers in England, and EBITDARM, D-A-R-M, is the proxy that we use for profitability, but owing to data constraints is calculated before interest, tax, depreciation, amortisation, rent and central overheads. That therefore has the effect of inflating the profit margins presented in this paper. Notwithstanding this, unsurprisingly, the profit margins across three subsectors that we segment the markets into have been declining. This is a result of workforce pressures limiting the amount of care provided, as well as requiring higher pay rates to be paid in order to be competitive. It's further compounded by general inflationary pressures, particularly utility costs for care homes and petrol and diesel costs for home care. The consequence of this has been a reduction in capacity. In the two years to September 22, providers facing off to local authority provision in market oversight reduced their bed capacity by over 8%. Similarly, in home care, whilst there is evidence of slight recovery in care hours delivered in recent months, like-for-like like data for the 15-month period ended September 22 shows that care hours delivered reduced by 14%. Of most concern, however, is the reduction in profitability for specialist providers who continue to struggle most with the ongoing workforce challenges. In terms of outlook, 
This will very much depend on the extent to which the additional funding that's been made available flows through to the providers. The adequacy of the April fee uh, increases in terms of local authority fee rates, the severity of any uh, continued workforce challenges, as well as wholesale utility costs. Does anyone have any questions? So, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, have the paper as well. So, questions, colleagues, Mark. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, Stuart, and thanks again for bringing a very thorough report uh, to us here uh, at the board today. Um, I think what you've outlined is uh, how, how, how fragmented the market is in terms of um, adult social care and uh, the loss of turnover due to uh, redu lower bed occupancy. Uh, so I wasn't really surprised that staff costs as a percentage of turnover had increased. In fact, I suppose I, I might even say that um, I was surprised that it was not more because of the sort of perfect storm that you've been outlining in this report in terms of competitive market uh, for labor, uh, the increase in agency, the increase in utility costs, and safe care staffing. Um, you mentioned specialist providers. I think you know, it's good that that's been highlighted because they are so critical uh, part of, uh, of this sector. Uh, but my question is, um, you referred to it, you referred to the potential for a greater increase in contracts being returned due to unsustainable pricing. I just wonder, could you dimension that a little bit and do, do we actually measure that? Is that a KPI that we look at? Okay, so um, in terms of the capacity uh, sort of exiting the sort of sector or contract handbacks, I think there's two ways of looking at it. Firstly, there's uh, what's happening in terms of beds, uh, and I've touched on that in terms of the uh, eight percentage point reduction in uh, beds that face off to local authority provision. So what's happening within the elderly care home space is the overall reduction to beds has been much smaller. But if you look, if we focus on beds provided uh, by those operators that face off to local authorities, then the reduction has been much larger. And why that is the case is because the overall figure is masked by new capacity going into the self-funder market. To your point specifically on what's happening with contract handbags, so um, that sort of phraseology is generally used more in uh, domiciliary uh, care. Um, it isn't a KPI that we specifically track, um, because if you sort of think about these uh, businesses, they're winning and uh, losing sort of contracts on a week by week basis. The data that I referred to was a specific piece of analysis that we did to understand um, with all of the pressures that were compounding over the uh, sort of last year, what, what impact was that having on care hours delivered? And that was to assist in the broader system conversation around well, what's happening with uh, hospitals and uh, hospital um, discharge. Um, in terms of the outlook of both uh, sort of further uh, beds ex exiting the market or contract handbacks, it will very much depend on the uh, additional funding flowing through and the local authority April fee settlements. Every, I, I would expect every business to have undertaken their contract uh, profitability or location profitability and be very much on the front foot in terms of understanding that if an inadequate fee uplift occurs, what their business response to that will be. And let's be clear, 
handing back provision or handing back a contract is a last resort. But at the end of the day, if it's not washing its face, it's in the commercial interest of these enterprises to frequently take that action. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, that's very well explained, and I appreciate that. And, uh, you're, you're really referring to the pressure that the sector is under, and uh, your data is from uh, quarter three. So we're hearing a lot of, at the moment, aren't we, about delayed transfers of care. So imagine that, uh, you know, turnover is further being affected in this respect. So you're, you're highlighting a real challenge for the sector. There is possibly the sort of early shoots of recovery, uh, dare I use that phrase, uh, from a workforce perspective in the home care market. So we believe from the latest analysis that we've undertaken that hours delivered may have at least bottomed out rather than continuing to decline. It's absolutely what now what now sort of happens beyond uh, Q3 into Q4 and then Q1 uh, of this year. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Obviously, the uh, utility uh, costs draw the eye, but I, th I guess it would be fair to say that a lot of these businesses have got long-term utility contracts, so haven't necessarily been completely uh, knocked off their feet by the, the recent rises. But I guess that's going to change over the course of time. Do you have any sense of of what that's going to do to some of these names uh, in the sort of in the eighteen to twenty four month horizon? So eighteen to twenty four months out. Um, businesses won't have uh, utility uh, cost protection, um, unlike interest rate uh, management or other hedging solutions. Utilities are only typically hedged uh, generally 12 months uh, in advance. Some of the largest providers are able to enter into more uh, sophisticated and longer term uh, hedging arrangements, but that is absolutely the exception rather than the norm. Normally, it's a 12 month um, cost uh, arrangement that's in place. If I sort of broaden my response to that uh, question out slightly, what's been interesting is that depending on when uh, providers locked in their costs, a lot of them were able to lock them in tighter than where the government support that has extended to business through to March this year was actually um, happening, was actually kicking in. And clearly beyond March, whilst uh, there is a further mechanism to provide some insulation from uh, further uh, utility cost increases, um, that's, that support is less generous than what has been provided and proposed through to March. The other uh, point to bear in mind is that where wholesale energy costs are at the moment, they're actually inside both the support that extends through to March. Um, so, so this is the point that I make around it very much depends on where those uh, costs move over the next 12 months, because firstly, the support from uh, government is less uh, generous. And secondly, where wholesale prices are at, the, are at the moment, that support from government isn't actually uh, providing any, or, or sorry, post-March won't provide uh, any protection from cost at the current level. It's very much a scheme designed to uh, provide some form of protection for exceptional cost increases, but again, beyond a certain amount, uh, the, if the wholesale price moves uh, in that direction, there won't be a full capping. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. Stephen, you had a question. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, two points, if I could. To, um, taking the points that both you and Ian have made, that market oversight is, a, is kind of a bit of a misnomer. It's not a 
full analysis of long-term trends of market entry and exit. It's looking at particular uh, providers. But is there an opportunity actually to, to, to develop some of the insight and the information that you have got, particularly in support of the new uh, ICSs, ICBs. We, we now have a whole set of new players across the country who also have an interest in the whole system in their geographies and need to be confident that they can commission the services they need to commission because there will be enough suppliers of those services. You've got some really valuable information to help the ICBs do that work, trying to work out, you know, have we got a confident long-term supply that we're able to commission from? So I suppose the question is, is, is there any discussion going on with the ICBs on, on those lines about how we might be able to help them just get a better understanding of the trends in their own geographical uh, supply? The second question is about w workforce and whether your information set also includes workforce costs because there has been concern, I think, that one reason for... Uh, the reduction in beds and, and indeed market exit is the sheer difficulty of recruiting enough people with the right skills to fill, fill the jobs. I think you said that you may be seeing a plateauing of, of that effect with the number of hours not reducing any further. Can, can you offer any insight on what you think is happening to, to workforce within the provider set that you're, uh, you're um, reviewing? Absolutely, okay. So let me deal with the second uh, question first, so workforce. The uh, financial insights that we've discussed today absolutely do capture the workforce cost. What I referred to in terms of a bottoming out of as delivered specifically related to non-specialist domiciliary uh, sector. Let me be clear, uh, workforce remains the biggest operational challenge across any uh, care operator um, in, the, in the sort of three sectors at this uh, point in time. Personally, um, I think that the workforce challenge is I, I see no reason as to why it is going to improve in the near term. And the reason I say that is um, the cost of living uh, pressures on households are continuing to increase. Yes, they uh, might loosen off as we move from winter into spring and the proportion of household income that's spent on utility uh, bills might reduce. Um, so I accept uh, that point, but I don't think it's going to uh, significantly ease the pressure for uh, the sector. The other point that I'm acutely aware of is we've seen a increasing trend for uh, people within the sector to take second jobs outside of sector to make ends meet throughout the winter. My concern is that that is them taking the first step of it's really tough. It's a tough job, social care. It's really tough to make ends meet. Actually, I hear that I can earn more outside. Let me dip my toe, see how bad, in inverted commas, it is. And then possibly we might see a uh, increase in um, exits as people think actually a job outside of social care isn't as bad as uh, what I'd been led to believe. To your first question on sort of ICSs and ICBs, I think, I think we need to appreciate because of the nature of the uh, operators that are captured by market oversight, they are national operators generally. And unless we are concerned 
about uh, the overall financial performance of a particular operator, we will not delve down to uh, within the national uh, sort of picture, if you like. So we will focus on the national uh, financial performance of these groups, because at the end of the day, um, if, if, if we focus lower down and get drawn into that analysis, we, we might start missing uh, particular problems. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the majority of our focus is at the national level to the extent that we want to uh, better understand something we might uh, dig down. So we might push providers to demonstrate that they've uh, undertaken contract profitability reviews, etc. So why I say that is because we're not armed with, inform with uh, financial information on a regional basis that might be of use to ICBs and ICSs. What um, the, the role that we could play is ensuring that we socialise the overall trends that we believe and see are happening across the entirety of the market, so that uh, particularly the ICBs can have that in their focus when they're thinking about their uh, sort of expectations of social care in the wider system. My other hope is that um, you know this forces um, uh, sort of the NHS to better understand the social care market in their um, locality and. Uh, sort of my sort of final point here is, yes, I absolutely do have uh, discussions predominantly with NHSE to ensure that they are aware of the headline uh, developments in the market. And indeed, I know that I have one later in the week, coincidentally. Thanks, Joe. OK. Any other questions for... Stuart. Stuart, just um, I had two, and they've both pretty much been asked and therefore were answered as well. But just to follow up on one point, uh, I hadn't appreciated, and we picked up your point, that if you look at exits in the market, it masks differing trends from uh, local authority funded exits versus uh, private funded increases, which I think is, is quite an important point to, to note. And whilst accepting the caveat this is only part of the market, it's a big, important part of the market that we are looking at. I just wondered if you had um, any further knowledge, just roughly the, even a percentage on or, or scale for us exits and, uh, and entrances. And would we have any view on whether there's any regional variation? I know most of these are national operators. Uh, so that and immediately wouldn't give us a view, but, but from your discussions, do you know if there's a regional trend there? So um, there is, so let me try and dissect that uh, down. Um, new investment into the sector by far and away is predominantly focused at the self-funder uh, end of the market. Um, why we're we seeing more sort of exits in local authority focused uh, provision is because investors struggle to make the economics work. Regionally, um, if you if you continue to expand on the self-funder theme, uh, in recent years, there's been more investment in the uh, south. Um, have, however, you know, a care home is all about understanding its catchment area. And these catchment areas typically would have been three to five miles. You might get a larger catchment area for a self-funder home, depending on how uh, rural it is, um, the other sort of provision in the locality. But that's the sort of broad uh, rule of thumb. The reason I say that is that there's pockets in the country. So Solihull, for instance, has had a reasonable amount of uh, inward investment in sort of self-funder care home provision. So that's a area to um, 
pick up outside of the general uh, sort of southern uh, comment. Um, but beyond that, um, it, it is very, you know, that that's kind of the overall uh, theme. But it does, you know, there will be investment uh, beyond, so further north uh, in the country where there's a less uh, sort of competition for self-funder uh, and a strong, buoyant local market because of the lack of uh, competition. OK, thanks, Stuart. I, I guess that's kind of a predictable answer, but worth asking anyway. Thanks very much indeed. So I think if there's no any other questions, uh, Stuart, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, hopeful update. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, if we move on to the uh, reporting updates, uh, <clears throat> uh, we'd moved the last meeting to uh, sort of regulatory oversight and then organisational matters, so I suggest we take them in that order. Let's deal first with regulation. So, Ian and, and colleagues, over to you. Thanks, Ian. Um, so, I think take, take the report in terms of its detail as read, but there were three things I wanted just to, to pick out in particular. Um, I think just to make the point around urgent and emergency care and the National Maternity Programme, that we're continuing to work across all sectors to ensure that we're, we're mindful of the pressures uh, facing services at the moment and at the same time we are representing the interests of the public in terms of uh, the delivery of safe, high quality care. And the paper outlines some of the thematic work that we're doing and colleagues can, can talk to those in a moment. Um, we've also engaged with the government's rapid review on mental health uh, around a week ago when the terms of reference were announced and we'll continue to support that rapid re review on mental health. Um, and we're continuing to talk to the Department of Health and Social Care ready for the new powers in relation to our work on integrated care systems and local authority assurance that both of those pieces of work are due to start uh, at the beginning of, of April and we, we're awaiting final approval from the Department of Health and Social Care on details uh, and exactly when we will, when we will start that, that work. But that's all I really wanted to say for, for now by way of introduction, Ian, and colleagues can, uh, can add detail and answer questions as needed. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> Sorry, I wasn't got my microphone. My apologies. Chris. No, no, no problem. Uh, just on the, just want to draw colleagues' attention to the work we've done on uh, learning from safety incidents. So this is the twelfth issue, and if you think back to the strategy, there's a strong, important um, work for us to look at not just when things go wrong, why do they go wrong, but how do we learn from them. So this particular issue is focused on capacity and consent, um, and it focused on a couple of issues where we know some organisations are struggling, particularly around staff training and also oversight, audit and monitoring. Um, what we try to do with these reports is to talk about how can other organisations avoid this happening to them. Uh, so we, we reference both the NICE guidance, the Mental Capacity Act and also our own um, NHS uh, information on accessible information standards. Uh, and we've recently tried to link it back as well to the, um, our report on Who I Am Matters, which looked at um, people with learning disability and people with autism, to again just try to link um, the, the good practice that we, see, we do see in some areas to what we expect all organisations to do. So just, I just wanted to make it clear to, to colleagues, this is a, one of a number of, of these publications designed, as we say in our strategy, to drive some learning from what we see around safety incidents. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thanks, Chris. Sure. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll just mention that um, uh, there is still evidence that the uh, demand in emergency and urgent care <clears throat> hasn't abated, although there are now fewer numbers of patients in acute hospitals with COVID and flu uh, following the peak in late December. Um, and there have been some uh, moderate, uh, uh, modest improvements in ambulance uh, handover delays uh, during early January, which has been reported. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'll turn to my other colleagues. Any questions for Ian or team on uh, the paper? Uh, I mean, I um, had a, a, a couple. Um, the, uh, I just wonder if there's any more to be said on the Hewitt Review and our input of that. There seem to be a number of, of parts to it. And Chris, I know you're, for example, attending 
some of the meetings, it might be helpful to um, elaborate. And then also just picking up on a point that was discussed elsewhere, but I think it might be helpful just to uh, put something on the record here, is, is the impact of the, uh, the, the strikes and the shortage of labour on how we will go about rating organisations. I think it would be helpful just to have some, some views on what the impact of that will be. So I think, Chris, it's probably one for you, and then Ian, you may want to pick up the other, perhaps one by Sean. Certainly. So um, uh, my colleague Joyce and I have been uh, heavily involved in the in the here it is. It sets out its work streams to understand how we can drive the right conversations at a regional level to drive the right change and improvement, both in ICSs and also in the relationship with local authorities. I think it's fair to say that we've been uh, our, our support and advice has been positively welcomed by the group, and we are what we're trying to do is to draw. Um, as we move into the regulation of, of ICSs and local authorities, how do we draw from what we've learnt from our early work and system reviews uh, to help guide and support ICSs and also to help link uh, both the, IC the work in, uh, in ICSs to the work uh, in, in local authorities? The, uh, the key challenge at the moment, I, I, I guess, is to make sure as we, for each area, that we have a good understanding of where each ICS and um, local authority starts from, what the issues that are affecting their particular area, and how their plans are, are, are seeking to mitigate and to, to improve on their base position. We've been engaging with a number of test and learn uh, pilot sites for around uh, around ICSs, and they've, they've been uh, very successful. We'll continue that with those conversations, and we'll continue to input not just into the regulatory ele element of the Hewitt Review, but also t into the uh, the insight around place. Uh, and as I say, I think we'll we'll see um, Patricia's report as an, as an important step into how uh, they both manage themselves and how we support that uh, that leadership moving forward. Thanks, Chris. Do you have a question here? Thanks, Ian. In terms of, in terms of uh, the work we're doing uh, with providers on, around strike action, one of the things we've been very anxious to do, of course, is, is to make sure that uh, we are mindful of the impact the strikes will have in terms of, in terms of staffing levels. Uh, but what we are seeing is a number of, of providers who are, who are taking sensible precautions in terms of, of, um, of, of cancelling elective procedures, making sure that uh, the public understand exactly what's going on. So in many cases, the public are not presenting for, for treatment in some cases. So, um, so thus far, uh, that has worked reasonably well, I think, and Sean can talk in a moment in terms of the detailed work that he's been doing with NHS England colleagues. Um, but I think, I think that the, there is a, a concern in the medium to long term around what the long-term impacts of cancelling elective treatment uh, uh, on a repeated basis and also the very practical point that um, what will be the impact of, 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 stri of layered strikes where more than one uh, group of, of people go on strike at the same time. But our underlying principle really is, is about talking to providers around what they are doing to make um, re to, to make to make their service as safe as it can be in in the circumstances. So I'm sure Sean can talk in a, in a bit more detail around the, the, that. Well, absolutely. I mean, the thing that we would be most interested in understanding <clears throat> in, a, in acute providers when there is industrial action or days of industrial action is the uh, steps they've taken to plan and to make sure that uh, the mitigations that they can achieve are in place and that they've spoken with their staff, they've spoken with union representatives so that uh, um, services can continue to be as safe as possible for patients at all times. So presumably um, <clears throat> if uh, the actions taken by management is to reduce the through flow, which they can do for elective procedures, volumes actually could be down. So if you're looking at it from the point of view of safety of people in hospitals, which is broadly our remit, um, there could well be no additional problem might be an outcome. In fact, you could even have higher staffing ratios on the other occasion. Um, the bigger risk potentially is uh, deferral of treatments, uh, but I guess that it goes beyond what we can assess or our remit. Is that right? Well, as long as, uh, as, long as the, um, uh, the, the management of those organisations have taken those steps and have looked at uh, their capacity and their ability to meet the predicted demand on those days, then yes, you would expect safety to be not compromised. But of course, uh, that is not a, a position that can be maintained over a long period of time because uh, you know, to, to maintain capacity, you might be um, uh, postponing elective care, you might be postponing outpatient care. 
um, sensible things to do in the short term to secure safety, but not, uh, not sensible things to do in the long term. Okay, thanks very much. So if there are no other questions on the regulatory side, should we move to the organisational matters here? Thanks, Ian. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Tyson just to just to touch briefly on on, uh, on operational performance uh, in a moment. But I did want to just just publicly pay tribute to Tyson and and, and his uh, leadership team um, for their ability to respond very quickly to the circumstances we found ourselves in uh, over the last month or so. We've we've been in a position where we have uh, done one of two things: we we have continued to uh, inspect uh, organisations based on on risk. Uh, but we've been we've been very rigorous about making sure that we can justify each and every inspection. Um, again, recognising that important balance between making sure that we take into account what's going on in terms of the overall busyness of of individual services and balance that sensibly with the risks to to, to the public. And we've continued to do that. Tyson and, and his leadership colleagues have have done a great job, I think, of of doing that, as well as uh, standing up a, a very significant program of work to add capacity to the social care system in particular. Um, as many of you, you know, uh, in social care, many local authorities will only buy uh, care from organizations that are, are rated good or outstanding. Um, and, and that's a very positive choice that, that makes sure that there's, there's good quality care uh, available to people uh, who use services. However, uh, if, a, if an organization is requires improvement or inadequate, it can, there can be a danger that it kind of gets stuck there. So what we've been doing is created a program whereby we've been talking to the local authority. Uh, we've written to every uh, director of adult social care in the country and invited them to, to put forward uh, the names of the locations that they'd like us to come back to. Uh, and we have a program, which Tyson will talk to in a moment, to, around creating more capacity into the social care system. That, in turn, unblocks the the flow of people through uh, through from hospitals and, and addresses some of the 13,000 people who are currently stuck in hospitals. So, and if I can just hand over to Tyson just to talk about the work that he and his team have been doing recently. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ian. And just, just to reiterate the, um, the thanks that Ian, Ian has given to the teams, I think the way in which um, the teams managed to sort of mobilise around our new operating posture very, very quickly was very impressive in exactly how, how we were able to do it last winter. As Ian has said, we have reduced um, the, the um, on-site on inspections we are doing um, with NHS providers, so that we only do those where we think there is risk, risk of loss of life. Um, but we are paying more attention and mobilising more of our people around um, trying to increase capacity in the adult social care sector, both by doing what we're calling improvement inspections, which is not only requires the improvement to, to good, but also by visiting unrated providers and seeing if we, by giving them a rating, we'll start to open up capacity in the system. We've set ourselves a target of 300 such inspections by the end of March, and we're confident that we should be able to exceed that. Another thing that we've been doing is... Um, looking at our prioritisation within the registration function so that we can prioritise adult social care and domiciliary care applications for registration, which again might be able to open up capacity. And again, the team have been making good progress in that regard. So by changing our posture with the NHS for understandable reasons, we are putting more, we are mobilising more around the adult social care sector. Thank you very much, Tyson. I suppose that's a a benefit of the new approach generally that, that we're adopting. So show validates the decisions were made a year or so ago. Uh, any questions for Ian Tyson or other colleagues on the organisational performance? We'll come to reporting in more detail later on, of course. But no questions? Okay. Um, well, let, let's move on. Um, <coughs> we've um, thought it... Uh, we asked if we could have an update on what we introduced, I think, pre previously, even briefly, called the Listening, Learning, and Responding to Concerns Review, um, uh, well, rather than title. Um, <clears throat> there are no papers for this. Um, it, it's a very much a work in progress, and we'll have <clears throat> a, a much fuller report with supporting papers for the March board meeting, but we felt in the circumstances it would be very interesting to have a, an oral update as to how things are going. Um, uh, uh, for those listening, uh, Ali Hassan, uh, as an associate executive, uh, not executive rather, um, <clears throat> we asked to uh, provide some oversight of what is going on as a, an independent uh, to the program, uh, but also as a, a link to the board. And uh, 
we said at the last meeting that we would finalize terms of reference and publish them, which we have done. So the terms of reference uh, are now on the website, uh, totally consistent with what we discussed previously. So, Ali, um, you chair the review board. Perhaps you'd like to make some initial comments uh, about how that's going from your perspective. And then um, Scott Duraraj, who's uh, leading much of this work, uh, perhaps we could ask you to give us a, uh, an update ahead of uh, the March meeting. But, Ali, over to you. Thanks very much, and I'll keep it brief. Um, we introduced the review and discussed it briefly at our last board, and the main messages I'd like to give as an introduction to what Scott will talk about are, firstly, we're making good progress on both the first phase and the second phase of the review. You'll remember that the first phase is a fully external review undertaken by Zoe Leventhal QC, while the second phase comprises five work streams that we're looking at across areas um, that we thought were identified that we need to look at as part of this review. Um, the second point to raise, I think, is that there are a wide range of areas that are being covered, and while we're making good progress in all of them, and the review will conclude in April, or by April, um, there is going to be continued areas that we need to focus on as an organisation, as you'd expect with a review like this, for us to embed as an organisation um, and to continue getting better at the substance of what we do. The third point to raise, too, is that there will be areas that are, to some degree, challenging, some of which we've identified, some of which will be some news to us. And we're all committed, I think, as an organization to really coming out of this review as strongly as we can and being a more effective organization. I'd also like to thank everyone involved in undertaking the work because people have been working extremely hard on this program and have um, worked with real professionalism and commitment to deliver what we need to. Scott, over to you. Thanks, Ali. Scott. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Ali. Yeah, so I think it may be just helpful uh, as a reminder that one of the core underpinning pieces of this work was to uh, ensure that we're building confidence and credibility in, in the public and our, within our stakeholders and our own staff. And we've continued to do that. We have extended our uh, our governance structure with a third member, uh, Anne Robson. Again, the details are all online as uh, normal process, but that an important part of the review to have that level of independent scrutiny into both the work we do and also, of course, the recommendations and findings. Um, so, again, yeah, just following uh, what Ali was saying, the Zoe Leventhal uh, piece is uh, completely independent and is King's Council led uh, by Zoe. And uh, we have been engaging to make sure that uh, for a number of key pieces to make sure that we're obviously uh, examining different sets of data and also to make sure that our our kind of emerging things are, are aligned and we're not missing anything, which is I think is working really, really well. And of course, Zoe's part, uh, because I have received some some questions uh, that have come in in a bit uh, in an inauthentic way, but I think I just need to answer. Um, was what is this review unpicking the tribunal, which of course it's not, and the terms of references uh, the chair has said are there. This the uh, the judgments for the tribunal were accepted in full, and this was actually to to, to uh, look at the protected disclosures uh, from that Mr Kumar made and the handling of those, and if race had an impact. So I just thought it was useful just to restate that if there is any confusion, especially with people maybe watching online. We're making really good progress, as I say. Uh, phase two, we have five work, strain, uh, five work streams, all of which are reporting uh, green on progress, and will all be reporting uh, as of the 29th uh, board. Um, the uh, report will be in two halves, as you may expect, because the King's Council review that Zoe is uh, leading, of course, has to stand alone as uh, fully independent, and then there'll be phase two. It is likely that it will appear, obviously, on the website as a, a continuation because it is a holistic view at a number of issues that uh, hit last year that we needed to respond to. There is, I think, a good level of uh, alignment between phase one and two and in the issues that we needed to respond to. And there's a high level of confidence that there's going to be no gaps or contraindications in the findings, which, again, is critical of a review of this scale, but also pace. Um, 
we've made sure that the data samples, as I say, are separate and uh, just to make sure we're, we're not leaving anything behind. There's been a high level of internal engagement through staff networks, and I'd like to thank the staff networks and trade unions and those who have been go undergoing organisational change, about 200, uh, 150 to 200 colleagues who have engaged in supporting this work. And I would like to obviously thank them for helping us get to this stage and making the improvements uh, and uh, the findings, etc. Uh, face uh, the 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 key other elements that we've kind of looked at, as you may expect, are obviously policies, processes, systems, and culture, uh, and they've been examined across most work streams. We are looking that the review will have approximately one third of findings, one third of recommendations, and to show that we have heard, we we have heard at university that people are concerned of will the CQC deliver the improvements uh, or the recommendations. And I'm confident by obviously uh, working here and having those discussions that the board are committed to do that. So there will be one third of the review also focused on the evaluation and how that um, there'll be recommendations for how it should be evaluated going forward to give that assurance of progress and delivery. And uh, just lastly, obviously, uh, to thank uh, Mr. Kumar, who was engaged both with Zoe and uh, myself on trying to uh, conclude this uh, review in the most timely manner and detailed manner and factually accurate manner as possible. Um, I thought I'd stop there. Thanks very much, Scott. So uh, questions from or comments from colleagues? Um, well, I don't have a question, Chairman, but I uh, would really like to thank Scott for everything that uh, he's taken on here um, and uh, just his diligence. I've had several conversations with him, and uh, I'm very confident that, uh, as he says, we will have a report that uh, we can respond to effectively, and it will have been very diligently produced. So thank you, Scott, and thanks, Ali, also as a colleague for... Uh, chairing this process. Uh, Scott, a um, couple of things. Um, one is more positing something for comment, another question. Uh, so, I mean, I haven't seen the findings, um, as you know, so I, uh, I guess it's still a work in progress, so I don't want to prejudge what comes back, but I think for um, <clears throat> March, uh, obviously the board can see uh, and note the findings. We don't have any input to them. I mean, they, they will be what they will be. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, it would be helpful to have uh, some management views or responses to how issues are going to be addressed. I don't think we'd expect them to be complete at that stage. Uh, you won't have had a chance to do it. But, but um, obviously we'd like to know how things are going to be addressed. Some will be detailed, some will be uh, slightly vaguer as to, to the sort of the process. So I, I presume we'll be able to do that, and then um, we clearly can't agree it now, but I'm picking up on your point about uh, whether people <coughs> um, think anything will change as a result. <laughs> we, we will need a mechanism to look back in six to 12 months' time and say, uh, so um, you know, this is what we said then, and has anything changed? So I suppose I posit that for, for confirmation. You're nodding, but you, you may wish to change it. Ian, I'll pick up with you as well. Uh, the, the, the question um, was that um, a big chunk of this is looking at people who are not employed by us and who live within cultures that we don't control um, reporting to us. So we can look at um, what we've done with something, but presumably there will also be findings or potential learnings for bodies other than CQC um, maybe it's too early for you to comment if you don't know what those will be, but I just wondered whether we've given any thought to, if we have those learnings, we can make those visible to and useful to um, people we regulate and indeed others in the wider system rather than just CQC, because I'm making an assumption here that while some of what you come up with is very specific to us, you know, we either don't have a policy or we don't have the right policy, for example, is us, but I'm rather suspecting that we are in part reflection of the system in which we operate, and therefore what comes out of this will not be just just for us. So it'd be interesting, confirmation, I guess, of the first point, and Ian may wish to add, but then I'd be interested in your views on the second, or Chris may have a view as well. 
Ian, do you want to pick up the first yes. point? So I think I, I think I, I, I'm. Uh, it, I would say that this review is, is very well timed at the moment because as you, we're obviously going through our transformation process, there'll, there'll be recommendations, I'm sure, around process, there'll be recommendations around technology, there'll be recommendations around culture, all of which are, we are currently uh, working on. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will be able to uh, dock each of these recommendations into, a, into an active and program managed work stream. That will mean that we'll have good confidence in terms of delivery. So we won't be sort of picking this review up from a standing start. It'll be, in effect, a running start, I suppose. So, so I'm very confident that, that from a managerial point of view, we will, we will be able to deliver on, on this. But And again, the, the other point about, about making sure that we can demonstrate delivery um, at, at, at sensible times in the future is an important part of this. But I don't know that Chris wants to pick up the points about how we would pass some of this learning onto other organisations. I think, and um, I'd probably speak before Scott, Scott, uh, Scott says this, um, I think the first thing is to make sure that we understand and learn the lessons for ourselves. But I think, you know, going back to what I said about safety through learning earlier, there is also an opportunity to, I think, to, 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 to showcase what we are learning and what we are encouraging others to learn. But I think this starts, I think the March conversation is very much about, well, what do we, what do we take away from this ourselves? How do we... How do we want to uh, position what we would might might learn from ourselves, and absolutely then getting into therefore what would we expect us to do? But I, I think the, the the first part of that, the learning for ourselves, is is critical in March. Uh, Scott, do you want to add to that? Or? Yes, I, I'd like I'd, I'd like to come back if I if I can. So first of all, uh, thank you, Mark, for your kind comments, and I'd just like to it's it's a it's a, it's a been a, a a huge team effort actually, where people at all grades all really uh, working hard to make this review uh, be meaningful and tangible to those people who may not have experienced what we would have liked them to experience. So I just want to to just widen that that thank you out if I may. With regards to the the evaluation piece, I think it is important that again the independent uh, review panel uh, or board, should I say, they will uh, give some ideas on how an evaluation, an independent evaluation can be done again to just help keep that confidence uh, and, and credibility there, as well as each of the work stream leads have worked on an evaluation technique that is, is meaningful as well. Um, and as Chris did say, I think it is important when we receive it just to hold on ourselves uh, for that moment, because I think people will look for us to do that. And then I think there will be, because uh, obviously I've got a little bit more insight onto some of the, the emerging tracks, there will be opportunities for us to learn from others who, who may do some elements better. But then, as uh, as we say, really sharing that transformation and improvement and, of course, the tangible benefits it delivers to our people. OK, thanks. I mean, Chris, just part of responding to you, I mean, I totally get that. Um, First and foremost, we need to look at this ourselves. Uh, and if we didn't do that the right way, the risk is it might look like deflecting, and that, that's not what it's about. On the other hand, part of um, an important input to our work is information provided by others. And um, with an eye to our, our role on safety of others, if we only, if we were to stop at only tracking, changing things internally, without thinking how we might persuade others to change, which would improve the frequency and quality or whatever of reporting where things are going wrong, then we will have, have, have missed a trick and won't be serving the populist right. So I, I absolutely agree. Let, let's take it in steps. But I, I wouldn't want to, on the 30th of March, found that everything was only about us and we weren't giving thought to uh, what learnings for the wider system. No, I difficult to know what those learnings are at the moment, so I'm commenting in the vacuum. I think that's right. And I think, I think it is really important that we, um, we can think about what the learning is for, for the wider organisation, say, as, as, as we do in other areas. I suppose what, I'm, what I was reflecting is in, in demonstrating that we are taking the action that we think we need to take, we are signalling to the wider system that we are making the necessary changes and therefore encouraging others to do so. And I think it's an important step for us that we can... Um, going back to the other reviews we've done in the past around uh, learning disabilities and autism, we've taken some steps ourselves to improve what we're doing and we call upon others to improve what they're doing. But I think that it's a, an important step that we are demonstrating our leadership and looking for others to support us in that, uh, in that space. Any other questions for Chris or Scott? St Stephen. It's kind of more a reflection, but it's, it's picking up something that, that 
Chris just said, I mean, the language we're using about um, making plans and taking action, y yes, absolutely, we've got to, to respond rapidly and robustly to whatever the conclusions are. But where those conclusions are about culture and confidence, we possibly can't go straight to this is the right response and action because those are things that will probably need some level of engagement across the organization to understand, well, what, how has this culture developed? What would create a stronger sense of confidence? So it may be the action in some areas is sensibly we need to carry on this discussion across our community or your organizations out there need to carry on this discussion across your community to get to the right answer in terms of culture change and confidence building. If we go straight into, here's a set of managerial actions, I'm just wondering whether that will be the right response. I think you look at it means, I, I entirely agree with you. Uh, I don't think we, I mean, I don't think we've said that. I think we said the, almost the opposite of that. I think we said, let's hear the, the, the independent report as it comes in March. Let's understand that for ourselves and what we need to do and the question I was responding to initially from the chair was that we need to understand it for ourselves, what we need to do, before we start to talk to other people about what they need to do. And I think that's just a, a, there's, there's a logical step for me about understanding what it is that we need to do. I think uh, the chair's point is a sensible one, is that there will be learning for other organisations in this as well. It starts with us understanding what we need to do, and it builds from that into what we've, what we've learned from this experience ourselves and what we can there, therefore pass on and share with others. Scott, you wanted to comment? Yeah, just uh, just following uh, Stephen there. So, and again, it's really hard because you haven't uh, had the detail or, or, or the insight. But the way we have structured the review and the reason why we have the independent experts is when we have a finding, what we are looking to do is use evidence based research and the best skills that are available to make the recommendations either to make an improvement or that more work will need to be done. And I think uh, the cultural element is going to be one of the harder ones, which is a, a global factor when there are cultural challenges to be improved on. But we, we have got the expertise who are helping to shape some of that. So it, it should be uh, well formed uh, with regards to making clarity what is an action and what is further work uh, that needs to be considered. OK, thanks very much, Scott. Any other Reflections or observations doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, look, Scott, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, sorry you weren't able to make it down to London, but thank you for joining us. Uh, Ali, thank you for the time you've put into this. So we'll uh, await the, uh, the findings and reflections on them in March. So thanks very much, Scott. Um, <clears throat> we'll move on to the corporate performance report. Um, there is quite a long paper here. Um, so we normally try to work on the basis, take the paper as read. I think on this case, uh, it'll probably uh, require a little bit uh, longer uh, or a little justify a little bit more comment. Um, something I, I have asked if we could do, uh, there are <coughs> uh, some areas in here where we are flagging in the, the later sections of the performance report that we are uh, showing as read or out of appetite. And I think it would be helpful for the board to understand why that evaluation has been reached, uh, but perhaps more importantly, what steps we are proposing to take to bring us back inside appetite. So I, I pose that as an advanced question. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember all I said earlier. Chris Usher, our finance director, has an immovable commitment this afternoon, so he can't be with us. So um, I, I'll turn to Ian perhaps just to introduce the report overall, and then uh, Tyson, and then we're joined on the team by Steph Tarrant, who uh, has had the enviable task of putting most of this information together for us anyway. So welcome, Steph. Uh, Steph works in, in Chris's team, so contribute to uh, the, the answers to the questions already posed and those that I'm sure that will come up during the discussion. But Ian, do you want to pick this up? Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, Tyson's going to cover off uh, uh, this lion's share of the operational performance, but I, I wanted just to pick up a couple of things which I, I thought were, I wanted to, were worth highlighting. Um, as we've as we've talked about a couple of times during this meeting, we continue to take a risk-based approach, and it does mean though that the average ratings are appearing to fall 
uh, as we are uh, as we are uh, mainly going to higher risk services. So, if you look at our ratings overall, 85.4% are, are of services are good or outstanding. But if you look at the services that that we have rated this year, only 61.2% are, are good or outstanding. So that that is quite a, a fall, and it does dem well, whilst it, it, it is too early, I think, at this stage to. Um, to make some uh, solid long-term uh, assumptions around that, I think it is worth just just noting that the, the the work that we're doing at the moment is flagging a significant amount of uh, amount of risk, and to some extent, it does validate the the overall approach we're taking. Is that if we're finding that nearly 40% of services are, are are requires improvement or inadequate, it does suggest that that our basic hypothesis around going to high risk services is is broadly correct. Um, I think I, I would like to just pay tribute to the, the teams who've been doing some good work on uh, on whistleblowing and safeguarding. They were areas that that we felt uh, were, were really important. And I think in terms of in term in terms of chasing those down, making sure that the information that's coming in is being is being is being captured and processed in a timely way. Uh, I think we've, what we've seen is some sustained uh, good performance over the last over the last few months in that area as well. If we move on to people and resources. Um, by the end of December, we were overspent by £1.7 million and were forecasting a £3.7 million surplus at year end, um, which, which is, I think is, is a surplus that, that has, has come down a little bit, uh, but it's about where we thought we would be. In terms of capital, portfolio, the, the portfolio will overspend by £2.9 million at, at year end. Uh, and we, we've been discussing with the Department of Health and Social Care how we how we resolve that. Um, the other thing I just wanted to flag up before handing over to colleagues is the high digital satisfaction rates on page four of the of the report. Again, I think that's just again a testament to some of the work we've been doing on new website, new web services, uh, and the fact that people are, are seeing those as a as a, as a really a really positive uh, development of the of the overall service that we make. But chair, if I could hand over to, to Tyson uh, to talk in a little bit more detail about his area. Thank you. Tyson. Thank you, Ian. Um, I mean, the, the paper and the slides speak for themselves, as, as, you, as you say, Ian, so I, I won't go through them. I'll just highlight a, a few more slides than, than, than the ones that Ian, Ian has already um, highlighted. I think the first one is, is number 25 that talks about regulatory activity. So this is regulatory activity, which is an inspection or a direct monitoring approach to which we've added a public statement. And the figure, um, the figure currently is, um, the latest figure is 56.5%, which is actually an increase on the last quarter, which was 55.2%. I, I think the, the other point I would make here is that because of our risk-based approach, we do sometimes keep going back to the same providers. So actually, the number of individual providers we will, we will reach across each year will be less than if we were doing them as a, as a, singular, as a singular entity. Um, Ian's already talked about the um, slide 26, so I won't, um, I won't cover that, other than to say that now that we've committed to do a several hundred improvement inspections in adult social care, where we're hoping to raise, um, with good evidence, ratings from required improvement to, to good, for example, that should start to see the number of good and outstanding may, may, maybe tick upwards again, um, but that's largely as a result of our, our change in posture, and I think it's still worth looking at the, the data over the course of a year. The next slide I want to talk to is 28 about registration, where I think it's probably fair to say that we're, 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 not, we're not on target to meet the business plan measure, which is around timeliness of different types of applications. What I would say um, about that, though, is that what we, have, what we, I think, have chosen to do instead, almost, is to focus on the good, the good health of the case working system. And if you look at the figures underlying some of these, you will see that the current volume of work in the system, the current number of um, applications applications rate, waiting to be approved is, um, is now lower than it has been for some time, at just over 7,000. I think it peaked at 8,000. Steph will probably have the, have the correct figure, but I think it peaked at 8,000. So the team have done a really good job on getting that down. Although the demand is going up, and I think we're almost 10%, have seen an almost 10% increase in applications over the course of this financial year, um, the, the productivity, the amount of applications being processed each, each month is still still very high and is over 3,000 a month and was over 3,000 a month again for January. And one figure that we have um, focused on in this board before 
is the number of applications that are over 28 days old. Um, they're ready to be dealt with, but they haven't been dealt with yet. That reached a peak of nearly 1,800 in September, and it's currently down to around 1,200, and that's the lowest since May 22. So clearly more work to do, but very much a, a, a good direction of travel. And actually, we have been bringing in some of the older work in the system. So the oldest application, I think, is probably around spring last year, whereas a few months ago, a year ago, it would have, been, it would have reached well back into the next site in the last financial year. Um, the slide on number number 30, I think it is, is to do with um, trigger, triggers of concern. And I think what that shows is really just highlighting our, our approach over the last a few months has been to focus on risk. And we now have 83% of our inspections are risk-based, although, as I said, that will probably change with the, um, with the change of focus on, on adult social care inspections. And that's probably, that's probably it in terms of operational performance, other than slide 36, which is to do with um, timeliness of publishing reports, and this is something that we, we continue to focus on. You'll see an improving picture on that slide, um, but also there are still a number of reports that are still to be published from November um, and December in particular. Um, a number of those will take longer than maybe we had planned because there may well be enforcement work that we are we're, we're undertaking with the provider, and so I think we'll get a more accurate, a more accurate picture going forward, but I just wanted to give the board some reassurance that um, this continues to be a focus um, for us from an operational point of view. The rest of the slides talk about transformation, which we've covered, and some of the HR and finance issues that, that Ian has covered, and then I think we move on to risk. So shall I pause there, Ian, for you to, um, to start the discussion, and we can pick the risk points up again. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tyson. So questions or comments from colleagues? Linda. Um, this relates to the staff sicknesses delivering our people plan, monitor percentage of sickness triggered by stress. Um, and I just wondered if we had any sense of the levels of sickness for stress and mental health if it was related to work or, or not. And also, do we benchmark sickness against other organisations? I think when I, we, we had a discussion about this at my, at my board, which clearly looks at just, just, the, just the operational teams. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the figures for you, but it, but it is complicated. I think the highest proportion of stress-related um, sickness is to do with things going on in someone's private life. Then I think we've got, we've got work-based stress, and then we've got a mixture of the two. So I would have thought that in many situations, obviously, particularly given the times we're living at the moment, um, the, two, the two will come together a great deal. Um, but I, from, from memory, I think the, the biggest proportion is to do with stress as a result of people's personal lives. Other questions? <laughs> Mike Fenn, oh, thanks, for the Mark. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, and Tyson, thanks for a very thorough um, deck of uh, papers, and also to you, Steph, thanks very much. Um, very pleased to uh, echo what uh, the Chief Exec said about uh, our performance with whistleblowing. Could I ask you to look at chart 33? I'm not sure this is a question for you, Tyson. It might be a question for Mark. But uh, this is the chart that's looking at services that require enforcement action following regulatory activity. And the footnote states that it should be noted that the, there is a lag in enforcement actions being published and therefore November's and December's data is likely to have a greater proportion of breaches. And the way I've read that, that looks like we, we've got the data but we've not been able to manage it to get it into this report. And, you know, seeing as data is a very important part of our strategy and being a smart regulator, I just wondered, Mark, am I, I hope I'm interpreting that wrongly and why we, we do have that, that lag. Yes. I'm, is that okay? In, um, yeah, I'm delighted to, 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 to answer that and say, yes, you are interpreting it incorrectly, but we'll, we'll update the, um, the, the, the narrative in here to make it crystal clear um, what that's saying. So it's, it's not that, that we don't have an issue. It's not that we have an issue with the data. 
Um, it's the fact that it takes a period of time for enforcement um, activity to complete in some cases sort of two or three months. Um, and so what we're seeing there with November and December um, information about the percentage of um, action taken um, it is simply we don't have that information yet. So when we get to the, 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 the February and March versions of this report, you'll see those numbers increase, and we would expect you know, there's a run rate there of about 30%. We would expect that to, to hit those levels once we have that information. But not, not a data issue, but, but you're quite right. It's slightly misleading. Okay, well, thank, thanks for clarifying that. It's just uh, you know, I wanted to, to be sure that uh, we uh, are not um, managing data poorly, and so you've reassured me on that, so thank you. Other questions? Mark. Thanks. Uh, two quick things from me. Uh, page 27 in the pack. Just on the, the chart on the right-hand side, unable to determine was about a third of the, of, of the sample, and I was just surprised that, to try to understand, that seemed, a bit, that seemed quite high to me, and I was wondering why that was high. And then my second question, which I know we've talked about before, but I think we just, and it's, you know, on page 35 and elsewhere, um, I think we just need absolute precision about out of hours, and when we uh, we talk about out of hours and, and and inspections with an out of hours element, and we just need to be, Belinda, I know has raised this before. We we need to be very clear when we're talking about an inspection which runs past the end of the day, um, uh, compared to uh, an inspection at a weekend or um, uh, in the middle of the night. I, I can certainly pick up on those. Thank, thank you. Um, on, on the first one, um, Steph may, may want to come in as well, but I think a factor may be that if, um, if it's a provider that we've not rated in the past or we've done an inspection and they've not been rated. Um, on the out of hours, you're, you're right, Mark, this, this is still the, the old data that we've been using, which will record as out, and hour, out of hours an inspection that starts an hour early or ends an hour late, which isn't truly out of hours. We are doing a project now from within the hub in, in my area to look Look at how we can do, how we can set our teams up with support and, and, and incentives to do proper out-of-hours work. We're starting to engage the trade unions on that, so I'm hoping that fairly soon we'll be able to come to the board and give, give you the outcomes of that study. But de definitely something we want to do. And as we as we look, move forward with our wanting to implement the ripper powers the, um, that you gave us permission to use last year, clearly out-of-hours activity will be will be important. Okay, welcome. You wanted to comment as well. Thank you. The only thing um, I wanted to add is there is a piece of work to be done in regulatory leadership about what does best practice look like. So we know we placed a real emphasis on increasing out of hours visits for services for people with learning disabilities and autistic people. Um, what does that look like for people in mental health, in patient units, in dementia settings, etc.? So as well as doing how do we support our staff to do this well and make sure all of our, um, our proper processes are in place to keep our staff safe for out of hours work, um, there's a piece of work around what's regulatory leadership's ambition about what percentage of, of inspections should have an out-of-hours component, and we're on the case with that. Okay, thanks. Linda. Thank, I'm glad you raised that point, Kate, because I was going to say, why is it just learning disability and autism? So I'm encouraged to hear that it's going to be other services as well. Thanks, Belinda. Any other questions before we move to risk? I, mean, I, I, I just had a, um, a couple, if I could... Um, <clears throat> I was going to pick up on this uh, time to, to issue reports, which you've already commented on, uh, and said that the, the right hand, towards the right hand of the chart, it will change as, as other things are issued. I mean, presumably, uh, the easier ones get issued first, so it's the more complex ones later. Um, but I wondered if, if you could say any more, or two things, really. One is, um, it, could you say any more about the um, overall trend and how it has been achieved. I mean, delighted it has been achieved, but what measures have we taken to get things out more quickly? It would be useful to understand um, both in terms of maintenance of quality on the one hand, but also how can we can continue that trajectory and get that figure very much lower, because it is still quite a long period of time before the public knows what we think, and it would be nice to, to get that down. 
And as a related point, um, maybe this is more for Ian, but <clears throat> given uh, what he introduced earlier in his remarks or in the last paper about um, uh, the, the shift in the way that we're inspecting in hospitals, what that might have, impact that might have on, on uh, timeliness of issue of reports. So that's a, a two-part one question. And then uh, just to the point of detail, on slide 34, um, the heading is monitoring the percentage of civil enforcements which receive representations and the outcome of those representations. Now, I can see from the chart how we've addressed the first part of that question. I couldn't read from this chart how we are monitoring the outcomes. Perhaps you comment on that. I'll take them in order. If I, if I can, I'll take the first one, then maybe I can hand over to Steph for the second one, because you're, you're right, I don't think it is covered in, in the chart. In terms of reports, I think the, I think the trend has been fairly stable over, over the recent period, with adult social care reports taking less time to complete than, than hospitals reports, quite often for, for, for very good reasons. Um, I think some of the reports are taking longer to complete because we can be involved in, in sort of significant factual accuracy challenges, and also if there's enforcement, it, it'll take longer. I think, um, I think the reason um, our performance is good is that we have a very ca clear KPI about this and our, and our managers and our, and our teams are very much focused on the KPI and will do what they can to meet the KPI. Clearly what we don't want to do is publish something that isn't right or something that we're still discussing with the provider, but where we can, um, our teams are, are very focused on getting the reports published because obviously, although we will alert a provider to, to anything that, uh, that is an emergency that, that we find while we're visiting, clearly the, the sooner the reports are better, the sooner the improvements can be put in place or, or the provider can benefit from, a, from an improved rating. Again, keep coming back to the activity we're doing now to increase the number of improvement inspections in adult social care. Those should be relatively easier to get over the line to publication because there should be less areas to, to dispute in them and therefore I would hope that the overall figure, um, once the data has become more up to date for November and December, will then start to go down even more. But actually as a, as a metric it's been pretty stable over, over what's been quite a, quite, quite a tricky period given the amount of risk we've been inspecting. But uh, Steph, can you pick up on the, on the other point? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I was just going to add in terms of the report publication, and it comes back to what Mark Sutton said earlier, we are finding that there's quite a time period um, between the different ratings and their publication. And that's why we caveat the last two months, because on average, our publication is around 34 days, but the good reports take substantially less time, whereas an ad inadequate reports can take up to 55 days. So that's why we need to, for both enforcement and publication, be aware that actually there may be a change in the inspection activity from November and December as some of those reports are still finalised and published. In terms of the representations, um, we are working on kind of processes to better capture the outcome of those representations. So we do have some data on this, which we can absolutely include in the next board report. We um, capture as an organisation whether the representations have been upheld. Um, whether they've, um, whether we've continued with the enforcement action, but also we're making sure that we're able to capture specific scenarios whereby actually we've been able to inspect the service and identify it's improved or where the representations may have been withdrawn. So we are just trying to enhance our reporting in this area rather than just kind of upheld or not upheld and really getting to the individual areas of that. But we can certainly include that in future reporting. Okay. Uh, I think that latter point would be really quite insightful because it tells us something about the, the way in which we're, we're doing this. On, on the, the timing of the reports, I mean, the, uh, I appreciate that more complex reports take longer, um, but the problem is that the more complex reports, which are possibly going to have more adverse findings, are the more important ones on the users of the, the system. So there's, a, uh, the, there's a, a mismatch there between the importance of what's going out on how long it takes us. So I, I, I would encourage, particularly as we simplify some other things, to see if that can be shortened. And I don't know, for example, whether there's any flexibility to look again at how long um, the people we inspect have to, to respond. I mean, if you contrast with Ofsted, for example, they tend to give two or three days, and that's it. 
um, which can be, you know, in advance you're getting a report, you have three days to respond and that's it. So I, I'm deliberately being slightly provocative over challenging, but, but you know, I do think 55 days, in honesty, is a long period of time uh, for something that there could be a real desire to have in the public domain. Yeah. yeah, can I just pick up on that? I, I, I mean, I, I, at the moment, we are uh, being fairly pragmatic about uh, the factual accuracy process, uh, particularly with larger organisations like NHS Trust, given how busy they are. So we're taking a, 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 as a pragmatic view uh, where people are asking for, for more time. So uh, we're slightly, in some respects, slightly moving in the opposite direction to the one you were just describing. But, um, but it is something I know that we've been, we've been talking about uh, more broadly as part of transformation as, as we start to change our, our methodology um, I think we will start to find that this factual accuracy uh, issue starts to go away. Um, the other thing just in terms of your broader point though about making the public aware where, where we where we, um, where we do particularly with hospitals we will write to the board uh, immediately post the inspection and if there are any particular issues that letter is expected to be made public um, so the public are advised through the through the hospital board as to what as to what we found um, and then the obviously the report the, the report follows subsequently so um, I, I think in a lot of cases the the public are made aware albeit it's, it's less obvious than than, than, a, than a, a full a full inspection report okay thanks mark sorry can I ask another question if I may you know we know, we know um, you know, we've, t we've talked previously about the pulse survey results, and I think we, you know, we know the, we're familiar with the data that has that has that has underpinned the, um, uh, the the ratings on on page 39. But it would be, I think, interesting to hear an update on uh, the progress that we've made with um, the the colleagues who volunteered to help us work through those issues and help us develop a plan. So an, an update on that would be really helpful. Um, thank you. So you're talking about our, our advisory group. Um, thanks so much. So um, we'll cover that a little bit in the people update in the next agenda item. But if I just trail it and then our people director, Jackie Jackson, will talk to it. So, um, so as you know, in response to our, our Pulse survey results, we wanted to bring together a group of colleagues to help uh, steer us about where we should focus our efforts. Um, there was fabulous um, take up from people putting themselves forward to the point that there needed to be... Um, a little process run in each of the directorates for nominated people to go. Um, they had their first meeting, I think, Ian, you, you attended. So it's, it's up and running. Um, Jackie can give you an update um, in the next agenda item, but it's really key that they are involved uh, steering us, but also that we quite quickly turn that into some concrete things that we can commit to doing differently as a result of it. Okay, thanks. If, if there's no other questions on the detail, I don't know who's going to pick this up, but perhaps uh, the question I posed right at the outset, if someone could comment on the, uh, the, the things that are evaluated red on the risk profile. Uh, some, I think, are very obvious why they're red, because we picked it up in other areas. Uh, but, but I suppose my interest is not so much why it's red, although you need to understand that, but um, some actions on uh, an understanding of what we're doing to bring it back within tolerance. And I think we've also discussed that for future reports, maybe that will be incorporated as part of the commentary. But uh, So that's for the future. Just for today, can you uh, sir, expand a little bit on what's in there? Is, is Steph, are you going to do that? Or is it Tyson? I mean, shall, shall, I, <clears throat> shall I kick off? Maybe Steph can talk about um, how the judgments were made, as, um, as you were very closely involved in, in putting the, the, the new approach together. Um, but in, ter in terms of the actions, Ian, um, each, of the ac each, of the, each of the risk owners will, will, will have put together a list of actions that need to be taken in order to bring the, um, to bring the risk into, into a, a tolerable a set sense, of, sense of appetite. Um, if I use, for an example, um, the one to do with productivity, um, some of those actions would include the fact that we are recruiting more inspectors. That won't necessarily make us more productive, but it will make us produce more, more, more outcomes. Um, we were also, are, um, as, as, as we've discussed previously, looking again at our productivity tool so that we can measure our pro productivity more accurately. And as we move into our new... Um, integrated teams. We are helping our, our managers, our new operations managers, to, to have all the tools they need in order to manage op operational performance. So those, for example, would be three of the actions that will be taken as a result of that being identified as, as, as a red risk. And uh, as you said, we'd be very happy to give more commentary around that in, in, in future updates. But maybe Steph can cover the point about how the judgments were come to. Absolutely. 
Thank you. And um, so in terms of our risk register, this is the first end of quarter where we've used this um, new risk register. Um, we are still evolving the process and other subcommittees of board will be involved in testing some of our mitigations um, starting from next month. The process that we go through is look at, as Tyson says, the, the risk owners, but we also have a senior leadership group um, which focus on risk and have a cross directorate challenge on the mitigations. Um, I think in terms of the, the ones that are, re are read, to be honest, there was a sense of caution in that and, and the group were very clear in terms of only mitigating the risk whereby we can see that the action has truly come to fruition. So in quite a number of the risks, there is actions that have been put in place. So things around the transformation, there's clear plans in place now, but because they're in its infancy, um, there is confidence there, but we haven't seen that mitigation come to fruition yet. So there is confidence that there's plans in place, but we just wanted to be sure that we were able to truly mitigate those risks. And the agreement was to kind of keep them as they were and review them in the future months. But we will absolutely include more detailed reporting now that this risk register is live in terms of those actions and commitments and how we can hold ourselves to account to make sure they do mitigate our risks further down. OK, thanks. I mean, I focused on the, the red because there's only six of them, and that's the things that ought to be of most concern to the board. But uh, whilst uh, I don't think any organization's ever been totally within rescue type for everything it does for all time, uh, the fact is there's an awful lot in here, the majority where we exceed the appetite. And it would be helpful to, uh, I don't want to make this too cumbersome reporting, but the, the expectation would be that every time we're not with an appetite, we're doing something about it. It's just the priority is those that were, were completely uh, uh, out, you know, out any sort of reasonable tolerance. Uh, so I think if, if you know, we need to be pragmatic about this. We don't want a 75-page report. But I think if we could have uh, an understanding of the actions, um, and, and it helps the board understand if there are any gaps and narrow things that need to be done might also help prioritise views on, on investments because inevitably there are some things where the response will be we can't do it without spending some money and then the question is is that spend justified in priorities to others so um, you know this is a journey but I think it would be helpful the other thing that I think if, if in terms of board reporting Steph if we could find a way of uh, commenting on the direction of travel so um, that's probably particularly true with some of the uh, the ambers here, uh, but, but an amber with a set of actions or even a red with a set of actions where we can see the risk is being addressed and coming down is rather different from something uh, where it's just getting worse that used to be green and is now amber and it's amber heading red. So, um, again, don't want a 75-page document, but uh, even using arrows to indicate direction of travel I think would help us focus and, and indeed the executive focus on the, the key things. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Tyson and stuff for that. So that, that was kind of my request. But anything else people want to ask, or are we done on corporate performance report? Looks like we're done. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steph, for, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, one more item, and then we have a comfort break. Uh, so, Kate, uh, glad to see you have been able to join us. I explained at the beginning you were with the Minister, but hopefully with us in due course. Um, <clears throat> so uh, quarterly transformation and people update. So I'll hand this to you and Noark. I think Amy and Jackie are joining us, but I'll hand it to you to introduce the uh, session. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. So uh, this is an opportunity for uh, myself, Amy, and Jackie to update you as the board about where uh, the progress we're making around transformation, but also an update on our people and the work we're doing to support them around change. So very short intro from me, and I'll hand over to Amy, and then she'll hand over to Jackie for the highlights in the paper, and then we'll take questions. So Amy, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. So um, I think the main thing to focus on in, in this update for transformation is the work that we've done to um, agree how we will roll out our new regulatory approach over the next year. So we have split this into four key phases. And by doing that, we believe we'll deliver a better experience for colleagues, uh, providers uh, and stakeholders, but also make it easier to adopt those new ways of working um, that are coming. So. Just in a nutshell, 
Um, phase one is around transitioning colleagues to integrated teams. So that's the new roles and structures that are really integral to um, operationalising our new regulatory approach, but also beginning um, to start our work around local authority assurance and ICS. Phase two is all about um, introducing these support services that are required to um, operationalise that regulatory approach. So it's things like regulatory governance and how we make decisions around what we inspect and things like that. Um, phase three is about introducing a new contact service, and that's primar primarily sorry, around making sure we collect the right data in order to really start to drive um, our insight-based approach to um, inspection and assessment. Um, and as part of that, we'll also introduce um, uh, an enforcement service uh, where we're looking to Im improve the current process. Finally, um, phase four is really about introducing uh, our new assessment approach at a provider level, but also really scaling our approach to uh, local authority assurance and integrated care systems. The final bit that I'll just mention before handing over to Jackie is we've um, spent an awful lot of time reflecting on what's worked well so far in transformation and, and what's, what hasn't worked quite so well. And we've put in place a number of changes uh, moving forwards to improve things. One of the most notable things that we are um, going to be doing differently is the way in which we um, involve colleagues uh, across the organisation in, in the way that we design uh, and deliver change moving forward. So I'll hand over to Jackie now, who's going to uh, give a bit more detail on the people side of things. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Kate. So just to pull out a couple of points um, in addition regarding um, Pulse Survey, then I'll come on to um, the culture, which will build on Amy's um, summary. So Pulse Survey Advisory Group um, has had the first meeting, really positive um, feedback from that. Um, the next date, um, as far as action, is the 24th of February, and this is where our directorate working with the um, advisory colleagues will pull out their three priorities um, and look to how they feed into a um, directorate action plan, which then can be monitored and reviewed. The directorate plan will be owned by leadership and regularly monitored on the advisory um, survey group. So I think that's the, the localised um, element. Then we're looking at the corporate priorities um, and ET or to agree those. So just a couple of points on um, Pulse Survey, but moving in the right direction. In terms of culture, coming into this role, I've spent some time looking at the activity that um, has already been started. So I wanted to split this into two. First would be the work that is being carried out by um, our ops colleagues, and in particular the transition work. And it's really making positive progress. So looking at a united and cohesive leadership team. So we've had two days of deputy director induction, which had really positive feedback um, and looking to build on that with managerial colleagues as we go forward for um, induction and support. Between February and May, there's a programme of work planned creating the environment for success. So that will consist of looking at good endings, transition, positive and good beginnings, and then how we look at team development going forward with regular reviews and checkpoints in terms of the success and priorities within that. So in the operational area, we've got really good foundation where we can pull work forward into the organisational wild culture work. So there will be a significant amount of that activity aligned from an operational perspective. But we'll need to look at what else we need um, from an organisational perspective. So running a series of workshops, executive team have already had theirs, working with people, leads next week to really start to explore um, how we embed the culture, what we need the culture to look like, what we've learned from ops, what we've learned from change, um, 
and consider how we make this not a separate project, which is often the case with culture. We need to embed this and really look at how we pick up the pace, how we measure, monitor um, and hold each other to account with that. Um, so when we're looking at how we pick up the pace, it's, you know, who we can use to support us and what we need in terms of leadership. Um, so they're the two um, items serving culture that I just wanted to share today. OK, thanks very much, Jackie, and thanks for, for joining us. Um, questions from colleagues for Kate, Amy or Jackie? Oh, Tyson. Sorry to come in again, but just to add to what Jackie said about the um, interventions in operations with the deputy directors and also with the operations managers, the feedback I've had from those who have been on those induction events has been really strong. So I think that's a great start to, to us coming together in our new team. So thank you to Jackie and the team for that. Thanks. Mark. Uh, good, good to hear uh, progress on the, 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 the Pulse Survey advisory group um, that is different and I think we knew that um, something different needed to be done this year in terms of um, the, the, in terms of ensuring that there was the right response and ensuring that that response was seen as as, as authentic as uh, and coming from the organization as well I, I, I think the you know I'm glad to hear that you're aiming for three priorities the danger and I've said this before, the danger here is in, 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 in a survey with a lot of things to, con to worry about that you end up picking way too many things and not really delivering on any of them. This needs to be really focused. Um, it, it needs to, there need to be things that cut across um, all the directorates and they need to be things that are, you know, simple to understand and are uh, you know, very measurable at the end of the day so that you can show real-time progress in relation to, to this. So I think that's great and, and yeah. look forward to, I'm curious to see what what emerges. I think it'll be, that will be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Mark. Thank you, Chairman. And Amy, Jackie, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks for the paper. I think I've got a question for both of you. Um, we've just been talking about people risks, and um, one of the risks we've identified, haven't we, is uh, colleagues don't have the appropriate skills um, uh, to, you know, to, to make it through um, tr the transformation. And I guess I've, uh, I think I've heard Amy, you say in the past that um, there was a skills gap analysis going on in terms of transformation. I think I've got that right. Um, so I just wondered where that had got to. And then Jackie, I was just wondering how the academy is setting itself up to uh, deliver skills training for us in both online and face-to-face and whether indeed we are ensuring that all our academy training is very inclusive um, for our colleagues in our protected um, characteristics. Oh, if you want me to go first, I will. Um, so from a transformation perspective, Mark, we um, absolutely have aligned all of our professions to kind of the, whatever the standard um, framework is for that professional area. So for delivery people, it's PPM um, and APM in certain instances, but for other delivery professions, it's different frameworks. So we have gone through that with all of our team. We have um, aligned them in terms of where they believe they're at in relation to certain competences and their development um, pathways are structured around those things. Just at a slightly different angle for the transformation programme in general and supporting the organisation to navigate the set of changes that are coming down down the line. Indeed, one of the things that we did as part of replanning was um, very much thinking about the type of training we give people to make sure it's truly holistic and not very one dimensional, um, but also that we are absolutely um, giving a sufficient lead time and enough time to people uh, to, to properly absorb 
um, that training and have chance to practice it before they have to use it in live. So that's that's part reflected um, in, in the plan that you've seen come before you. I'll just hand over to Jackie now. Brilliant. Yeah. In terms of um, the training and development, Academy colleagues are working with Tyson and his team in terms of the support and training required going forward. These are under five main headings of policy process, systems behaviour and technical ability, and then thresh, threshing out the um, content under each of the headings. And we have also got our DNI manager and we'll be linking in with our staff groups as well in terms of um, the content. And the Academy does have um, an external advisor in terms of the technical um, setup of training to make sure it is accessible for all. So I'm quite reassured that I think we um, got everything ticked off in terms of how we make sure it's inclusive. Well, thanks both, and actually it's very good to hear this crossover between different parts of the business, all aiming towards that goal for us to be fit for purpose and ready to deliver, so thank you. Other questions? No others from colleagues, just a couple from uh, me. Um, <clears throat> firstly, on the, the people side, I suppose I'm confirmation take for granted, something we touched on earlier, but uh, we, we have this listing learnings review that the board considered 20 minutes, half an hour ago. Um, I, I, again, difficult to comment without having seen it yet, but I'm assuming the stuff coming out of there about ways of working, a culture and everything else that will need to feed in. So the timing may not be quite immaculate, but, but it, it seems it ought to be pretty good that you will still have time to do some redesign as yeah. necessary. So um, yeah. that, that would be, be um, useful. Um, and then uh, you mentioned in here that the executive, it's probably more one for UK, but you mentioned the executive has looked at um, uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> corporate services. Sorry, I can't find the page. Uh, but it talks about uh, <coughs> a couple of priorities being to um, commence the corporate services design work but also, of course, we've got to mobilise the teams for the regulatory transformation. I'd just be interested if there's anything to say at this stage about the corporate redesign and um, what is the relative priority of work, or is there any pressures in doing both? Thank you. Um, so uh, there's a couple of key commitments to put out first, which is we will have learned from the management of change that's gone on to date, predominantly in Tyson's area, and that will shape how we do our, our, our approach to corporate services review. So that's a commitment we've made as, as an exec team, and I'm confident that feedback will get through the learning, listening, and responding to concerns review that will highlight to us where we could have um, done better as well as uh, things that we've done well around management of change. So, so the first key thing to say is we won't do anything on corporate services review until we are assured that we, we can take that learning and, and demonstrate how we are going to do things differently and adapt to it. Um, the second thing is we, um, so it's a bit of an advisory group, group theme, but um, I, I've been a fan of advisory groups over, over the years. And um, when I first took on the interim chief operating officer role, I established a, an advisory group in the corporate services where I invited colleagues to come together and meet with me to inform me and advise me and steer me. And um, we've decided we're going to use that group and we're going to expand it slightly to incorporate Chris's area and, and Joyce's area. And so uh, engagement and policy and strategy as well. And that advisory group is going to help, again, us think about our work around the corporate services review. And already in, in my very first discussion with them, they kind of came up with eight principles around um, ensuring we're not marking our own homework, making sure we really challenge what sits where, et cetera. So we want to have a group of people really going with us on the journey in a really meaningful way, uh, shaping what we propose. So, so the conversations we've had so far as an exec team is a real ambition to work with the expertise of the current directors in corporate services to shape what that will uh, look like. Um, it's an active piece of work that will get clearer in the next few weeks, and, and no doubt we'll want to have a further conversation with board as with the organization when uh, we can talk a bit more about what the next stages uh, will look like. Um, but that's the main sequential thing, is locking in the learning from management of change that's gone on to date to inform how we do the next, um, the next kind of chapter around our corporate services uh, review. 
Yes, yeah. And just to, and just to add to that, in terms of the, the the bigger picture, one of the things we run as a, an exec team is a design authority, an organisational design authority, and we do that quite deliberately so that we can keep an eye on the on the load, if you will, on the organisation in the different parts of it to make sure that we can we can load balance and then we can make sure that the that the work that's going on in the transformation program um, is it doesn't doesn't start trading one bit of the organisation off against another, and that it is it is we, we can cope with it uh, because on the one hand we're kind of redesigning one piece of an organisation whilst that piece of the organisation is supporting another part of the transformation. So it's important to make sure all of that is is seen in the in the round, and we, we do that as an exec team as uh, on top of the governance that, that Amy and colleagues uh, run for the for the program itself. Thanks. Any final uh, questions? Well, if no, um, Amy, Jackie, thank you very much to you for joining us. Thank uh, you. See you later. Always a pleasure. We'll see you again. Uh, thank for you. Those bye. In, bye. Oh, bye. For those in the room, uh, let's treat ourselves to a 10-minute break. Uh, it was scheduled. Um, <clears throat> so why don't we uh, reconvene, uh, we'll say just after uh, 3.30, if that's okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I, uh, we're now going to have a, um, an update on there was a sustainability green plan agreed uh, long before I joined the board. Uh, <clears throat> but we, uh, probably my colleagues will explain this in more detail, but we've broken that into two bits. So what we're considering today is a report back against the uh, internal uh, element of those plans. Um, and what we're being asked to do, I think, is note the report, but also there's some suggestions uh, as to what we'd like to do in the future or what the executive would like to do in the future. So uh, there's an element of approval or signing off on that as well. Um, Kate, do you want to pick it up now and also introduce our two guests? Uh, thank you. Thanks, um, colleagues. So very warm welcome to uh, Max Hood, who uh, is our Head of uh, Workforce and, and many other things, including emergency planning, um, and Thomas, our, our new Sustainability Manager, who's new to the organisation. So very warm welcome, um, colleagues. So um, as you said, um, Chair, this is an opportunity to check in on progress against our, our current Green Plan, but also to kind of set out ambition around our plan around uh, net zero. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Max, and then we'll get into questions. So over to you, Max. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, hopefully the report's fairly self-explanatory. Certainly looking at the green plan, we've got updates there and what we've been doing about reducing travel, reducing the size of the estate, recycling, uh, made big strides forward in, uh, with the technology team in terms of the uh, um, disposals or, um, um, and sort of changing out equipment, both in offices and, and for, for colleagues who are home-based. Um, we um, are in a bit of a strange period where we've had a benchmark, government set a benchmark year, which is pre-pandemic, um, and we're now obviously, coming, thankfully, coming out of that. So trying to establish what the new normal looks like in terms of things like travel and, and how we work as an organization, plus all the change, is, will, will uh, pr provide us with some challenges, I think. Um, but at the same time, I think you can look at what's happening around the NHS and other organisations. Our green plan's looking a little bit sort of dated uh, and in need of a breath of fresh air and a sort of focus more on net zero. So I'll perhaps talk, ask Thomas just to talk about what, that, what achieving net zero for us might look like. Uh, yeah, so... Um a lot of the discussions so far have been with the Department of Health and Social Care to make sure that we're aligning with what's expected of us from them, expected of us from the NHS. Um, the main focus when it comes to the net zero um, initial steps is essentially um, ensuring governance is set in place. And that is a mix of reporting governance as well as internal um, who's responsible for what, where are we going with this. Um, next steps then is, as Max was pointing out, the 2017 baseline year that we're currently using is obviously pre-COVID. Um, I'm currently in talks now with the Department of Health and Social Care to um, decide what might be done about that. There's obviously an importance to include the impact of COVID on, um, you know, on the, the uh, emissions, on travel, on energy, whatever it is, um, and the 
impact that will have on not just the baseline year but on future projections, making sure that we are an exemplar organization. We're one that other organizations are looking to and, you know, wanting to emulate. Um, next steps then would be uh, calculating emissions based off of that baseline year. Um, moving on then to basically setting a mix of both short and long-term reduction targets, um, then determining what steps there are to, to hit those reduction targets, and then importantly having um, set re review processes in place, be that with the uh, executive team, be that with the board, and then be that with smaller sustainability champion groups uh, within different sites, within different directorates. Um, main focus obviously as I said initially, is on governance uh, and making sure that that's clear, and then also incorporating the impact that working from home is having. So we're not, um, in a sense, ignoring the emissions that are generated from staff working from home. We're making sure we're keeping that in mind whenever we're looking towards any developments, any projections, um, and we're incorporating that in any plans we're, we're looking to work on, basically. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from colleagues? Stephen. Uh, to, if I could, um, looking at page 58 of the pack, um, you're, you're reporting the CQC performance data for 21-22, but of course that was maximum COVID lockdown. So all of those hugely impressive reductions against the 2017 baseline kind of a fairly meaningless. Do you have any sense of the bounce back when we get closer into a sort of post-COVID new normal? Second question, the thing about, you know, what your n net zero plan might look like, are you going to be allowed to use carbon offsetting? And is that part of the thinking? Um, so I think... In answering the first point, there will be a bounce back without without doubt. You know, we'll be we'll, we're seeing that already, but we are changing the way we're working as well. So obviously, the sort of methodology that we're we're undertaking will look different from how we used to go out and inspect and regulate. So I think it's quite hard to us to, to sort of nail what that will look like. But I would imagine there will be a significant bounce back. But we just need to make sure that. A, that we're tracking that properly. We're only sort of particularly around travel, traveling when we need to, and then we're trying to move people onto greener modes of transport, so out of cars onto trains where possible. But again, you know, we inspect and regulate across the whole of England, some very remote areas, so we know inspectors will, you know, will have to um, use, um, use, use cars. So can we incentivize? electric vehicles or encourage people through this with various car schemes. Um, so uh, it, it's hard to ascertain at the moment, but uh, the other thing we'll be doing is benchmarking with other organizations in terms of what sort of patterns, but you know, we're, we're unique in as, as much as we're the only health and social care regulator in England, so what we do and how we uh, set ourselves up um, for the future um, I expect there will be a reduction from what we used to do, but how big that is, it's hard to say, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. I think i just just add to that as well, um, and we were actually speaking about this earlier. Um, obviously, as you pointed out, massive reductions, for example, from 2017. Uh, this is one of the big reasons why I'm, I'm currently speaking with the Department of Health and Social Care about incorporating COVID's impact a bit more, as well as uh, working from home. Uh, but an important thing to look at as well is and that we're going to look to examine uh, with this net zero plan, the transition from the green plan to the net zero plan, is uh, different ways of visualizing it. So not just uh, looking at the overall number of here was our 2017 you know, maximum energy output, here was our 2021 um, energy output, but looking at it, for example, per square feet of an office space that we use per individual work in the office. So we can actually see in reality what impact did staff working from home have on this? What uh, impact did maybe um, increased or reduced numbers in different offices have on this? Um, and what impact did potentially even reduced office space have on this to, to make sure that we, we understand better where we were so we can understand better where we're going? 
Yeah. And, and just to just to build on the first the first question, I think one of the things we've been doing around transformation, of course, is designing uh, a, a mode of operating which involves less travel. So, you know, we over the course of years, inspectors were often uh, living far away from the place where they were working. As part of the work that that we've done with with uh, Tyson's team, people are now you know, predominantly living and working in the same geographic area. That reduces a degree of travel. Introducing roles like assessors for and inspectors and so forth again that that reduces the number of people that are traveling about so uh, and using technology and remote working and so forth so so I think the, as Max quite rightly really says there will inevitably be a bounce back but we've kind of tried to dial out structurally quite mm -hmm. a lot of the the travel that probably was going on in in 2017 but we'll have to see where that where that lands really over the next year thank you Mark so once all of that is understood and known I'm assuming you won't be at zero you'll still be some way off zero. Yeah, exactly. So my second question yeah, was, offsetting. what have you been asked to do by the government? Is it just to do your best to get towards zero? Or if they're saying, no, you've got to have a plan to get to zero, are you going to be allowed to use carbon offsetting? Um, we, so we will be aiming to go achieve net zero. Um, the department's already published its strategy for, for net zero, so it hopes to go, I think, it's net zero in travel by 2025 and net zero as an organisation by 2030. So we feel we should be setting out, you know, sort of a, a similar course. Part of that might be offsetting, and it's interesting, it's a question I asked um, our Director of Finance, who can't be with us today, is, you know, what are the sort of, what are the issues around using public money to pay somebody else to offset your carbon footprint question. So we're, we're exploring that. But there's also carbon insetting, which I wasn't particularly familiar with until fairly recently, in fact, until when Thomas joined. Where, so it's looking at um, it's all, it's this sort of circular economy. What do we do with some of our technology? What about furniture and things like that? So you can use some of that to offset other things. But um, I see no reason if... NHS has set itself a target, Department of Health and Social Care has set itself a target to reach net zero that we shouldn't as an organisation as well. And we should you know, aspire to that and do everything we can to achieve it. And um, on, on, sorry, um, on offsetting as well, so the department, for example, um, they are looking into initiatives for offsetting. They haven't um, identified any specific flagship ones that they, they might want to specifically undertake but as part of their net zero plan report for 2030 they have noted in each for example in energy and travel and, and biodiversity and so on um, that they are at the moment looking into offsetting measures they just haven't identified specifically what those will be uh, and then yeah as, as Max said uh, an alternative to offsetting or something to uh, tack on let's say but offsetting is insetting which is essentially instead of going and paying a uh, company maybe outside of your supply chain or outside of your organization to plant trees, clean up, whatever the offsetting is, it's investing in your own supply chain and in your own organization on more sustainable measures. So instead of, say, planting trees, you're maybe investing in renewable energy for yourself, you're investing in more sustainable measures for yourself. But that is balanced with offsetting um, because when it comes to net zero, um, it's, it's near impossible for an organization to get 100% no emissions for very mm. obvious reasons. Uh, mm. It's usually somewhere between 85 to 95 percent, depending on what the, the organization does. So that other 15 to 5 percent, let's say, has to either be offset, inset, or a mix of the two, um, which, as Max noted, is what the Department um, of Health is currently looking at. So coming back to the um, the point about sort of us changing as an organisation how we work and things. I guess one of the things we will be seeking to try and influence and make sure, and, it, and is part of the uh, agenda, is sort of hardwiring sustainability into how we work as an organisation, into how we operate, how we inspect, how we regulate, how we use our technology, and just sort of um, because. We've, we will struggle compared, we haven't got a huge fleet, our estate is reducing, so that some of the easy wins that other organisations might have, we don't have available to us, so we'll be focusing on those things that we can influence. Though I think the answer to your question, Stephen, is the clues in the name is net to zero, not absolute zero. <laughs> the question is, what is the offset? Mark?
Thank you. I'm really pleased to see this, really pleased to see um, uh, continued progress on this. This is Im important for people who work here. It's a, you know, call differentiator always for um, uh, alignment with a, a sense of alignment with an organization and, um, uh, you know, any aspiration to be an employer of choice. So this is, this is, this is important. Um, uh, just a couple, uh, you know, a, a, a couple, but, you know, we've got a way to go. <laughs> we've got a way to go in relation to this. And I think for, for the reason I'll mention in a moment, I think it's going to be harder for us than, than, than some, some others. Just one, you know, one small but important point. The numbers on uh, electricity performance that you've got here in the, in the appendix are quite significantly different from the number that was in the, um, last the late the last time we looked at the, this page in the report and accounts. So can we just double check and make sure that that's that that, that, that that's right? Um, the, the substantive point I wanted to raise is we, we've got to be very careful about spurious accuracy here. If we have a huge number of huge percentage of our workforce are working from home, and we've got a um, uh, a, a growing number of, of, of the offices that we occupy, like this one, multi-use offices, um, making assumptions about that, so you, you, you can fairly quickly imagine getting to a point where actually there are assumptions underpinning mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, to a material extent what, what, what we have in there. So I think we'll have to try and over time do things that are, that are, that are different, doing some sampling if we can uh, get people to to cooperate, um, uh, showing the home working experience as a, as an exemplar best practice. Um, you know, different mm -hmm. ways of doing it because I think actually the numbers are not necessarily going to tell us a really uh, uh, give us an accurate picture of uh, of what's going on with uh, a workforce that's largely remote. Can I just pick up on, uh, in terms of the uh, annual report, I think it, it has changed since the last time, since, since it went to um, uh, National Audit Office, So, and it was, it, it was changed as a result of a comment, but I don't think you've seen the change in it since. Uh, but I'll double-check with, uh, with Chris and make sure that everything lines up. And then just to, just to add to the point as well about um, working from home and engagement and the importance of that, um, uh, that's, yeah, uh, absolutely crucial, and especially when it comes to uh, so many staff members working from home. It becomes very difficult to track and monitor, for example, waste, energy. Are they doing what they should be doing? So the big focus is on, you know, uh, as was pointed out, um, engagement information is a huge one mm -hmm. um, and I've been speaking to the department about this about creating information packs and I've actually been working with them to create information packs for uh, staff members for ALBs uh, as well as other government departments um, as well as um, looking at estimates for um, how much you know one worker from home for example generates in terms of energy and ways and there are ways to estimate that based on you know the energy you say of a, of a monitor on a laptop um, the challenge then comes from how do you measure reduction on that and that's something that uh, we're still I'm still speaking to people and working out what the best way to, to tackle that is if, if I may actually I've got a number of comments um, given time, if, if you want to take these away for a future time, do. But um, <clears throat> the um, firstly, I think as an organization, and it, it's probably a wider issue for the management, is to understand the interlink between the energy usage and the viable business model. I mean, if we can't have a position where the only metric is reduction in energy, if we did that, uh, we'd get rid of all the officers, um, everyone would sit at home, we'd never go visit anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, at an extreme level, that's clearly not viable. Um, I think it's an easy win to say, well, we've actually physically got to go inside a hospital if we're going to you know, inspect it. Um, I would argue strongly that some meetings have to take place physically, like this board meeting, but you know, there has to be some sort of design and probably there needs to be some integrity to whatever we come up with, which might be influenced by you know, market research, peer groups, or whatever. So there's, mm -hmm. there's something around putting this in the context of the, the business model, and it may be a minimum viable degree of 
of contact. I personally have this view that businesses are going to find over the next few years that the more people will be coming back into the office, for example, as they realise the consequences of, of people not being coached or trained properly online. So that's probably the most substantive one. Um, secondly, um, the metrics. I mean, it's interesting you, you highlight things like energy here, sorry, electricity here, but um, what a lot of people would do is look at the source of the energy and say, well, you know, we've had a contract that's 100% renewable, and therefore there's no impact on the environment if you believe it's 100% renewable. So, we know, for, in terms of reporting, we're not really so much interested in the energy we're using, but to the extent we can track it where it's from, which might lead us um, for looking to the executive into understanding whether we have a choice on that. So, if we have... Um, a choice in where we buy our electricity from, then a way of achieving net zero is we only buy from certain companies or, you know, under certain tariffs. If, on the other hand, it's a shared building, we have no input, I think it would be helpful to call that out because mm -hmm. we could be in a position where some of the major costs, of, uh, some of the major emissions are, are just not within our control. And I think it would be, be helpful in the plan, if by plan we mean the actions we're taking, to be clear on what we, we can or can't uh, influence. And I suppose just wrapping a couple up, the third thing is around this working from home. I mean, clearly it's hugely complex. You know, we can't go you know, assessing the energy efficiency of you know, the homes that 3,000 colleagues work from. But So uh, others, well, better brains than mine, will work out how you're going to make those estimates. But they do have to be holistic. So if someone's working from home, yes, they may have the heating up, but they're not travelling to work. So, you know, there's offsets there that, that one needs to take into account, though I know others are. Um, uh, but, but final point from people working from home, I mean, as an organisation, we're only responsible for the emissions generated by people working here. But, but in truth, the carbon footprint of 3,000 plus employees is probably more what they're doing when they're not here working for us than when they are. And I just wondered if we would thought of uh, or were planning to do more to help individuals and their personal environment save energy. It may not be something that we can be held accountable for, but it is something that would arguably make a bigger difference now than uh, further reductions on our own footprint. So sorry, there's a number of points there. Respond to what you can now, but the first one probably needs to be thought about for later. Um, I think they're all extremely good points. On, on the last one, I think, uh, as Thomas said, um, I think engagement, communication, provision of information is critical to this, um, both in our roles as employees, but also if we, you know we should and will widen that to just provide you know with um, providing information about good practice for things they can do in their own time as well, or you know hobbies, pastimes, what they buy, how they recycle, and those sorts of things. So we can signpost lots of things and encourage people to. Uh, you know, to adopt good practices, and in fact, we get a lot of feedback from some of our colleagues already about things they're doing to to be greener uh, at home. Uh, you know, that have got nothing to do with CQC, but just you know, sort of good good tips and habits to share, which is great because we can tap into those three thousand people as well. No, and, and on that topic as well, I've um, uh, meeting with the, the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, as I said, one of the things we were working on is um, packs that can be provided to the ALBs about this. Um, and actually, I've been working on a uh, sustainability at home uh, document as well around that same idea to basically provide, be it waste, be it biodiversity, be it uh, actions, you know, volunteering, what, what have you. Um, and as well as energy, obviously energy is such a, a massively important thing for people at the moment in relation to sustainability. So ways to cut down, ways to save, ways to reduce, um, and what to do. I think for the, the other points you brought up, for example, I think uh, with the energy supply, I think that's crucial. And, and that's why, for example, one of the things I really want to look at and intend to investigate more are alternative ways to measure so instead of, you know, as I mentioned, looking at, for example, per square feet in an office per employee, but as well as that, you know, if we're looking at, say, um, we've had X amount of rail miles per year, well, it's great to know that, but what would be better is, well, how much CO2 equivalent, for example, as that generate, we have a huge amount of energy usage, but in reality, how much of that is owned by us? how much of it is owned by maybe other people who share the space, and importantly, how much of it is maybe coming from um, renewable sources mm -hmm. and how much of it is coming from fossil fuels. So I think uh, a big aspect of and a big thing that I hope to tackle while here is um, 
new ways of looking at things and making sure that we're, we're examining it from as many angles as we can so we can point to are we doing enough, what are we doing, and have we actually done things that we didn't celebrate that we should have celebrated, mm -hmm. for example. So what are the next steps? Um, so uh, let me just get it up for example. So the next step is uh, establishing governance. So over the next uh, month, month and a half, it's going to be establishing reporting procedures. Um, for example, I was speaking to the department about uh, things like the green and government commitments and uh, audits and reports that we might need to adhere to, as well as internal governance. Um, so which teams within certain directorates or individuals at certain sites might need to have specific oversight over certain actions. Um, and then from that point, we go on to uh, data gathering, uh, and again, looking at things in a new way during that data gathering stage. Um, then calculating the emissions based off of that data, and then using that to generate actions um, with the hope of, by the end of this summer, having a defined, you know, here's our governance structure formalized. Um, and as well as this, actually something important to point out, um, alongside this net zero plan, one of the things I'm looking at building is an EMS, or an environmental management system, which is uh, the hope is to essentially use that to buttress the um, net zero plan. And uh, the environmental management system, essentially, it's a collection of all of our policies, people, and procedures in relation to sustainability um, in one centralized location so anybody can find it, anybody can see it, and most importantly, those who need to see it and who are responsible for sustainability in whatever aspect they are can find everything they need to in that one central location. Okay. So, I mean, part of success, I guess, will be incorporating some of this in business as usual and uh, coming into the mainstream performance reporting, which will then feed more naturally into things like the annual report as opposed to other things. But I think it would be we, – we don't have to agree a time now, but I think it would be helpful if you come back in six months or something with this flushed out as to actually how are you going to do some things differently and give us a better feel for what's in our control and what isn't. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much indeed. Thank for you. Both thank you. you. Appreciate it. Glad to see the progress. Uh, good luck. Welcome to CQC. Thank you. Um, so I think the um, – on to a couple of things that require approval. One is our equality objectives. Um, Ian, I think this is over to you and Jackie Jackson coming back to us, I think, and also Lucy. Welcome, Lucy and Jackie. We can see you now. Thanks, Ian, and uh, welcome to Lucy uh, and Jackie. Uh, just a couple of quick remarks uh, by way of opening before handing over to, to Lucy and Jackie. So in July 2021, we published our new equality objectives, uh, and they, they are the equality objectives up to June 2025. They're listed on page one of the paper, page 60 of the diligent pack. Um, we've moved our annual reporting to better align with our business planning year, which is why we reported in July and we're reporting again now. Um, I think an important headline um, in all of this for me is that we are really integrating the, the work that we're doing uh, in this area across our core business processes um, and, and also embedding equality work into, a, into the single, uh, single assessment framework, both at, at the work we're considering doing in ICSs as, long, as well as the work we're doing with providers. And it, it really – that sort of embedding it as a core part of what we do and the core part of the way we speak – I think is really important. I mean, pretty much every conversation we're having around ICSs or around every conversation we're having around providers talks to this issue of equality. And it is quite noticeable, and I think it's a huge tribute to, to Lucy and her team in particular, that we've kind of – that the, the notion of equalities is in the water supply now in the organization in a way that people are asking that question repeatedly. And I think that's a real, a, a real positive. And, and equal, I'm talking about equalities in, a, in, a, in the very broader sense of, of the word as well, which, which, is, which I think is really good. The aim here uh, for today's paper is to agree the delivery priorities uh, and the detail of which is on page five uh, and onwards in the paper. So that's all I wanted to say really by way of introduction and then hand over to Lucy just to say a few more words. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Um, Ian's just done uh, just about what I was going to say. So, um, so yes, just to say we've made good progress um, since we last reported, but though it was only um, seven months ago. And um, the the key things are pages five to eight of the of the papers, which outlines what we'll do for next year. There's also a very 
long appendix which g gives a, a lot of detail around um, both our deliverables and our measures of success. Um, and I know the board were, were keen to see that following the July paper. So, um, so yes, I'm happy to answer questions on any of it. Just pass over to um, to Jackie to to speak particularly to some of the um, internal facing um, workforce equality issues within CQC, which sit in Equality Objective Five. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, um, I don't intend to go over the four points that are in the paper um, in any great detail because they do form part of. Um, our bigger strategy. However, I will just pull out some activity um, by way of update. So reasonable adjustments. I think we've made some really good progress over the last few months um, on reasonable adjustments. Um, so we've got our DEN network sponsored by Mark, um, who again ha have been having really good conversations, which was, was resulted in contribution to, to thinking in terms of in specific, specifically, um, our approach to recruitment, the support to candidates, the panel and uh, shortlisting. So, um, I think we've made good progress there. Notwithstand any recommendations that come out of the LLR review as well. And also, I think we're having really good dialogue um, with colleagues and listening to and listening to feedback. So I think in terms of reasonable adjustment, it feels as though we're moving to a much more positive place and a one where there's really good dialogue um, and, and, and listening. So certainly reasonable adjustments. Um, and the other uh, point was just really the, the progress we're making on the independent panel members. So that's due to relaunch in April. And again, following feedback, making sure that um, we include independent panel members in shortlisting activity um, and encouraging more people to be independent panel members with the relevant training and support. Um, but like I say, the four points that are on the, the, the bigger part of the paper will also form part um, of a bigger update on the whole strategy in the months to come. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. So questions, colleagues from colleagues, colleagues. Ali. Thanks. Um, just a couple of observations. Firstly, there's clearly a tremendous amount of focus continuing on this and a lot of great work done. So congratulations to you both and the teams you've been working with to deliver this. Um, I wanted to deep dive on using our independent voice to reduce inequality. So the work we do with the organizations we regulate to help them reduce equalities. Um, recognizing the fact that the last time that we assessed their perceptions was July. And since then, there have been increasing economic challenges, which typically tend to worsen rather than improve inequalities. It'd be helpful to um, align on when we would next get feedback on what we're doing in this space with providers, but also really think about how we're working with providers to um, obtain their stories and help them share best practices about how they've reduced outcomes in different groups who encounter inequalities. So just something to think about for next time, and thank you for the great work. So I can respond to that, Ali. Um, thank you. Yes, we, we, what we're trying to do with our independent voice work is to build looking at inequalities into every piece of independent voice work we do where it's relevant um, and and also to do some specific pieces on um, on that focus on um, inequalities. Um, for example, um, la uh, about um, 15 months ago now, we published um, uh, our maternity um, report that covered um, maternity equity, particularly for black women. Um, and we're now doing um, further work on maternity where we're picking up the, um, the, the, the recommendations we made to ourselves, if you like, the commitment we made to ourselves about continuing that thread of looking at equity. And we will be taking that forward in our next round of maternity inspections so we can report on that. In terms of cost of living, um, we are doing some work on that um, led 
by our data and insight team to look at evidence across what we've we've got on 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 cost of living and it's an area that obviously is, is really important as we expand our equality work into health inequalities into socioeconomic um, issues, but as well recognising that many groups covered by the Equality Act, such as um, disabled people and people from certain minority ethnic groups, are also more likely to be in poverty. So we are trying to build those issues across our kind of insight function and then to do specific pieces of work, as well as build better evidence for our big pieces like state of care. So Lucy's absolutely right uh, in that, that assessment. There's just a couple of things uh, additional to say. So alongside the thematic work we'll do in things like maternity, we're also having conversations with uh, the ONS who produce a health index score, which is due to be updated. And now we want to link that to our thinking around ICS and local authority assurance so we can see, in a sense, the starting position that... that um, that uh, local areas have as a way of judging how well they're moving, supporting uh, uh, people in their area. So we'll continue, as, as Lucy's absolutely said correctly, we'll continue to, in, uh, uh, to bring it into our thinking around thematic pieces of work, and we'll also continue to have that overview perspective as we begin our assessments of uh, systems and places. Mark, you again about as well? Right, thank you. I mean, perhaps um, if it's okay, an opportunity for me to talk and expand a little bit about what Jackie said about our, um, our disability equality network, because um, there's been a, a huge amount of activity that we have um, undertaken over the last year, and I think um, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more detail on that, if that's if that's okay. Um, Jackie talked about reasonable adjustments, which I think is something we've made some some really terrific short-term improvements around. Um, and that's focused around, as Jackie said, around um, uh, around interviewing, around uh, recruitment processes. It also covers um, you know, specific uh, needs of colleagues, particularly with um, um, uh, with protected characteristics like um, neurodiversity, who have, um, in order to get the very best out of colleagues at interview, um, you can. Uh, there, there are things that we can do, and we have done, to be able to make it a better experience. But lots of other areas that we've um, we focus on as well. So, for example, um, accessibility from two perspectives. One is, um, and a lot of work done in, in in my technology area to improve the accessibility for um, for our colleagues um, to, uh, you know, particularly with um, hearing or visual impairments. Um, particularly through the Microsoft 365 um, uh, work, but also how do we make sure that we, we're using the best of those accessibility um, tools in the work that we do and the, and the material that we, that we publish um, externally. Um, and I know, you know Chris, we, we've talked before about the uh, making sure that we've got um, uh, accessible reading materials at the appropriate reading, reading age for um, uh, for. Uh, for public material, um, we've we've also um, uh, done a lot of work um, to uh, help support colleagues um, with uh, with their career ambitions. Uh, and we've got a um, a recent program that we've just launched, the Inclusive Leadership Pathway, um, which we're um, which we're really excited by. And we've, we've we've started that very recently, and that's specifically about helping colleagues. Um, uh, from uh, both, uh, both disabled and from eth ethnic minority um, uh, colleagues to help further their career prospects. Um, I think also um, recognising that um, the role of the line manager is really critical in supporting um, uh, supporting colleagues, so doing some work around um, training and supporting our line managers um, understand uh, more about how to be um, empathetic and um, uh, an understanding of um, uh, uh, to, to eradicate um, discrimination, um, uh, improvement work in our policies, um, uh, and ensuring our recruitment process is um, fair, open, and transparent uh, as it possibly can be as well. And lots of work done around uh, attempting to attract um, colleagues externally uh, with protected characteristics. Um, and I'll probably leave it there if that's okay. So, so lo lots of work, lots of work going on, and this is all under the uh, the, the, the guise of attempting to um, uh, 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 obviously improve our 
um, at workforce disability equality standards um, as well, according to that standard. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Some specifics and a general message about all the work done. Mark. Thank you. Uh, Lucy, I think, you know, you've done a great job on, on this. I've had um, the opportunity to discuss quite a bit of this offline, and, and one of the things that, you know, I'm glad Ian mentioned it up front because it's, you know, it's really important that this is not a bolt-on and that this is integrated into everything that we do. And, you know, we can see from this paper the, uh, you know, the, the reach of equality considerations through the organization. It does, you know, if you do it well and it permeates just about everything that you do. Um, I think that's, that's really important for maintaining, um, you know, you, we, what we want the sort of initiative to do is to influence everything we do but not duplicate everything that we do. And making sure that you know your approach allows you know light touch governance in terms of oversight of progress, but it's not setting new targets or driving f uh, additional accountabilities across the organisation. And I think that's tremendously Im Im important that we m that we maintain that discipline. Um, but uh, th thank you for all your work to get us this far. Thanks, Mark. Any other? Julia, yeah, sorry. Just, just to add, we're also developing and launching Stay Well at Work plans, so it encompasses more than a disability network. So in an ideal world, everybody would have one as a supportive measure, whether they had any additional or specific needs. But if they didn't at a point in time, they could always revisit it. So again, to cover all the networks and all employees at CQC. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Lucy, you had your hand up. Is that from earlier? Or? Yeah, yeah. This is just to make one point about the intersection between the um, regulatory work and the uh, and the workforce work is that one really good example is on the inclusive leadership pathway. We're running some stretch projects for for cohorts in that pathway, and a lot of those stretch projects are actually to further things within our regulatory equality objectives. So we're trying we we'll, we work very closely together the the kind of internal facing and external facing aspects around equality, so that we we give. Um, a lot of learning and development for colleagues, but also take those opportunities to use the experiences of our colleagues, whether that's around disability or, or ethnicity or, or other protected characteristics, to build that into how we develop our regulatory work as well. And that's really exciting work, joint work that we're doing. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Any other questions or comments? I just had one uh, out of interest detailed question, really, but you talk about... Uh, Work, developing a shared statement of commitment with two other ALBs, NHS England and NICE. I just wondered how you selected those two or why only those two, because I could have seen that blood and transport or resolution or one or two others would be equally relevant. Well, the the two the the two other ALBs are leading that with us, but we're but we're the the core hub, and we're going to reach out to all the other ALBs that that um, that attend the Chief Executive of Health and Care ALBs um, group um, to see who else wants to be. And this came from an original meeting that Ian chaired um, back. Uh, nearly a year ago now when we, we looked at equality in some depth at the, at the CEO's meeting. Um, but it was nice, um, NHSE, and we're kind of driving it forward um, to try and get something to give more clarity to people in the city, to other ALBs and to, and to people working in health and social care and to local systems about, about tackling health inequalities in particular um, and the different roles and responsibilities of different um, ALBs. So it's being driven by NHSE and Bola Olabi's team in NHSE and by, um, by NICE and by, and by us, but it will extend out to other ALBs. Okay. I, I... Ian, you chair the CEO group, so leave it to you to pursue that. Uh, Mark, last comment. Sorry, just one thing very quickly. Uh, um, the local inequalities outreach plans, do you want to sort of just to, uh, explain what that is? But, but I think more importantly, you know, when, when are we going to hear about the outcomes of, the, of that pilot work and, and whether that's so been successful? 
Thank you, Mark, because that is one of our big ticket items for next year, really. So we're 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 um, kind of trying to get the piloting work done between um, in in quarter one and quarter two, possibly into quarter three of next year. Um, I've just signed managed to sign up three. Um, three deputy directors in operations to pilot in their in their areas. So we're getting ready to go doing the prep work for that, ready for when the new local teams are formed. So that, that's very exciting because that's using um, using the advantage of having multidisciplinary local teams to actually go out and talk directly to people that we might not hear of from other routes. So we will continue to develop things like give feedback on care to try and make them as accessible as possible. But we know that there are certain communities where we will need to supplement what we're doing, not repeating what providers are doing, but to triangulate what we know um, in local areas to use a, a bit of the, the resource in the local um teams to do that and that will be yes q3 we should know about the pilots thanks Lucy. Uh, we're being asked to uh approve agree with our one years prove the the general direction of travel and the priorities for next year so been a good discussion for a number of points i haven't heard any qualifications or additions so we agreed on that okay well done ladies uh so thank you very much indeed for uh, coming along and talking us through that well done um, the, uh, just a couple of final uh, things. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, uh, they were circulated a while ago. I haven't been notified of any comments, uh, if there are any. All connectors approved. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we had a couple of actions carried forward from uh, previous meetings. Uh, sorry, my machine closed down here. Uh, but I think they're both done, um, so I propose to close those if that's okay. They're both picked up in the performance report we discussed earlier. So that deals with the, the log. Um, just a couple of final points from me before I go around the table for any other business. Uh, I realized the other day that nothing about the annual report and accounts on the agenda. Uh, it's 10 months after the year end. So, um, Ian, do you want to tell us where we are? We are wait, we're still waiting for the final pension scheme um, accounts to be to be finally signed off. The la very latest from from Chris is that we are expected to lay accounts in February, subject of course to receiving those final audits. But uh, we haven't got a date for laying yet. I mean, it's uh, obviously expressed before you know, we we did all we could have done many months ago. Uh, I mean, at one level. Um, it doesn't matter, except there's some really quite good material in the ARA about what we've done, and it's not public, and uh, by the time it is, it'll be outdated. So I, I think it's something maybe we could ask. Um, we, we can't speed up the audit process. That's beyond our control, but it's almost like questioning whether we can't bifurcate the accounts and publish what we want to publish that would be of interest to people and the numbers could follow, which perhaps something we can sort out next year because this is, is a little frustrating uh, or put another way around there's not a lot of point in putting all this effort in the important accounts if we can't publish it so um, the only other thing I just want to mention I did flag it right at the outset is this is Mark Saxton's last board meeting Mark you are currently for another four weeks the longest standing member of the board um, I know uh, the non-execs have uh, valued your contribution over many years that's non-execs past and present uh, the executives have done likewise with your um, helpful support and advice, particularly around uh, people matters, but other areas as well. And, and speaking personally, um, I inherited you as the senior independent director, but it's been a huge benefit to me to have your corporate knowledge and be available to chat to periodically just to find out what's going on and bounce things off you if, if, if it were probably to change what do you think people will think so that's been hugely beneficial to me so really on behalf of um, we're not saying goodbye to you yet you're here for another month but it's your last board meeting so on behalf of all my colleagues can I just um, say thank you very much indeed for the board thank you personally Ian and can I just echo Ian's, Ian's point on behalf of all of exec team colleagues just to thank you Mark for your your relentless support for us um, uh, throughout your tenure uh, and, and really constructive thoughtful challenge uh, and you're always available on the end of a phone for, for anyone who wants to chat to you so really appreciate and thank you and the very best of luck for the future well thank you 
Um, that's uh, very kind of you. I just wrote a couple of words here. I just wanted to say that I've worked with fantastic colleagues, both past and present, in this fantastic board. Um, what I've really enjoyed about the CQC is that we always seem to be learning. Uh, we value our employees. We talk a lot about our, our, our people. Um, we put the service users first. I just think that, that we continuously go back to that, and that's a, a great place to be, uh, and I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, we listen, we act, and we respond. I think we add value to a critical health and care system affecting everyone in England. And I just want to say it's been an absolute privilege, and I've been really proud to be a part, and as Ian said, to be a part for at least another month. So thank, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, is there any other business from anybody else? If not, well, look, that brings a... Um, uh, ten minutes over, apologise for that, but uh, we finished the main formal business. Um, as you know, we, we are willing to take questions from the public here. Um, we do have three questions submitted in advance uh, from Robin Pike, so I'll take them individually. Um, I think people know they're being asked to respond to them. I hope that's right. Um, the first is, how is CQC currently regulating hospital emergency care departments? So, Sean, do you wish to pick that up? Thank you, yes. I can, I can summarise how that is happening at the moment by saying our our inspectors are continuously assessing the level of uh, risk in the provider organizations that they work with, and they do this um, by looking at a number of sources of information um, that includes uh, performance data on, on the, the performance of the provider by our data insight uh, function, by looking at um, feedback from patients, feedback, feedback and complaints from patients, feedback from the public and from staff members. And um, when that indicates to our inspectors that the level of risk is, is high, uh, we respond in a number of ways. First of all, we would probably undertake um, enhanced engagement with the organization, first of all, to clarify and, and um, uh, understand the issues. But we would also um, put, uh, convene a management review meeting where we would plan an inspection and um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the, uh, the inspection would take place and depending on what the inspection found, uh, would the appropriate follow-up action would be undertaken, which could range from um, um, uh, enhanced interaction to, to formal enforcement. So that sort of summarizes the approach that we take at the moment. I should say also that um, decisions at the moment to, uh, to undertake an inspection do have senior oversight from colleagues in the, in, in, in the, in the CQC. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, Kate, actually two for you here. Um, first is, how are providers of domiciliary care performing during the winter months? Uh, thank you. So uh, the short answer is it's a little bit too early to say. Uh, let me expand on that a little bit. We looked at um, data of uh, inspection reports published between November and January compared to March and uh, May of last year. It appears that there is a slight reduction in the number of requires an improvement and inadequate ratings that have been issued. However, our earlier conversation, we talked about how um, it can take longer to publish requires improvement or inadequate um, inspection. So we wouldn't want to read too much um, into that. So, so we're out. We're inspecting. Um, we are committed to doing some improvement inspections, as, as Tyson no doubt would have, um, ha have covered. Um, but broadly, uh, a slight reduction currently in published uh, requires improvement or inadequate ratings of home care providers over the winter. But watch this space. Okay, well, we'll watch the space. And finally, uh, this one's about us. Uh, how does CQC engage with trade unions when changes in methods of working are planned? I think the reasons for that are obvious, but Kate. Thank you. So we have a number of forums where we can have local and national uh, conversations with our, our, our trade unions. Um, I think we will. Uh, there will be lessons coming out of the listening, learning, and rep responding to concerns review, which will look at how we um, worked with key people, such as our trade unions, around management of change. I think our unions would join me in saying that we have uh, worked uh, incredibly hard, particularly over the last six months, about early engagement with them. And I think generally relations are in a, a, in a in a 
much better place at the moment between us um, and the union. So we have a number of formal mechanisms, but also we really welcome union colleagues sitting on some key uh, groups, such as our, our advisory group that we referenced earlier as well. Thank you. Ian, do you wish to add? Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Well, so I think that brings us to the end of the questions as well, so formal business. So thank you very much indeed, colleagues. Thanks once again. I know some people had to make a real effort to get here today, uh, whether it's um, we're staying overnight because you can't get home on a train or whether it's special childcare arrangements. So it is very much appreciated. Thank you.